also look. Okay, got it. So you can look at this problem uh, classically. And in the classical way, you can look at it two ways. One is through Hamiltonian theory. The other one is through Newton's law. And let's do it through Hamiltonian theory. Assuming that we know the Hamiltonian of this system, which is the sum of its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. P, P is the momentum here. So the first term is the kinetic energy of the system or a, a pendulum or an oscillator. The second term is just like uh, the potential energy of the pendulum, assuming that the pendulum is obeying, uh, obeying Hooke's law or being in the quadratic potential. And if you go through the requirement that P and X, which are called conjugate variables of the system, if they vary in tandem, so as to keep H a constant, okay? Only P and X can vary. So if you vary them in tandem and requiring that the total variation is zero, you can show that it's very simple calculus. In order for this to vanish, then the rate of change of the momentum has to obey this rule. And then the rate of change of the position of the pendulum has to obey this rule. And you can, of course, look at the Hamiltonian again, which is the total energy. You plug it in there. You get two equations of motion. The B dt is equal to that, and the x dt is p over m. The second equation is just that uh, the x dt is the momentum. Okay, And of course, you can combine the two equations and obtain this equation of motion for the pendulum. And this equation of motion can also be obtained using uh, Newton's law, but we have obtained it purely from the energy conservation viewpoint. Why the Hamiltonian theory? Why Hamiltonian theory is important is because there was what inspired uh, Schrodinger that came up with the Schrodinger wave equation. So next we look at the quantum theory of a pendulum. Again, we start with a classical Hamiltonian, which consists of two terms. And then Schrodinger was very much inspired by two laws, one of which is the Broglie's hypothesis that a particle is both a wave and a particle and it has momentum. And then the momentum of the particle is given by this equation where K is the wave number of the wave that is associated with the particle. And assuming that this wave like behavior is there and if you plug P equal to H bar K square, you get something like this. And then uh, Schrodinger was also inspired by the fact that Planck found that energy packets are related to H bar omega in this fashion. So if you can write this uh, Hamilton equation, which is classical into this form, uh, it inspires you to find a quantum form of this equation. So if you replace P hat with partial, partial X, or if you replace the momentum with an operator, <clears throat> which is partial partial x, then this simple equation here becomes an ordinary or partial differential equation in this fashion. This one just becomes partial partial t, and you assume that the wave function has something of this form. By separation of variables, you should have something of this form, and then you can convert this into an ordinary differential equation. And it turns out that this ordinary differential equation has solutions that's been known for uh, over a hundred years, I would say, since the 1800s. And they are written in terms of Hermit polynomials, which is this term over here, tapered by a Gaussian function. And, and these are closed form solutions and they are normalized with these ugly things out front here. Uh, furthermore, the eigenvalue of this system is known. Okay, because this is a closed form solution, you can figure out what is uh, e sub n is, is n plus half h bar omega, which has unit of energy. And these states are called the photon number states, or sometimes called the Fox states. And these are the eigenfunctions of this system. They are given various notation. Sometimes you just write them as such, and mathematicians will write them as such. Uh, Dirac will write it as such, and then in a very terse notation, uh, you see that many physicists says we'll just write this function as such. So you have to bear in mind that a vector, a function is a vector. Okay, to a mathematician, the function is a vector. You can either 
write the vector in this manner, or you can write it using direct notation or in this way. And these vectors are orthonormal, or they can be orthonormalized. Okay, so if you look up uh, Wikipedia, uh, you see this wave functions being plotted for you. And what you have is that you have these wave functions on the right-hand side. <coughs> one, thing, one, one thing of note is that there's a ground state uh, wave function here, which is this one over here. It has the lowest eigenvalue or lowest energy level. Okay, these eigenvalues are related to energy level of the oscillator. And it turns out that these energy levels are all equally spaced in the space by h bar omega naught, which is the energy of a photon. That's why these are called the photon number states. And then um, this is usually called the zero point energy. It is the leftover energy, uh, even if you look at a ground state, if there's no photon there, okay? Uh, we will not talk very much about this, but uh, there are many papers written on this topic. So before I move further, uh, let me try to make the ugly looking Schrodinger equation into a beautiful form. As I say, Schrodinger was motivated to come up with this equation. And if you do the separation of variables, you can remove the time dependence and make this into an ordinary differential equation. And you can uh, change the unit of position x into C, and this equation becomes a lot more beautiful in this manner, but it's still C square and partial square, partial x square here. But if you look at this equation, it almost looks like b squared minus a squared kind of thing. So it motivates some kind of a factorization in the sense that perhaps there's a way to factorize this equation. I will not go into the detail of the factorization. There's some kind of high school algebra that you can do yourself, which is that if you define two operators, one of which is called the uh, annihilation, uh, the creation operator, the other one is an annihilation operator or the lowering operator. Then you can actually rewrite this equation in a very compact form as just the product of these two operators. And you can think of this as now a matrix operator. This differential operator, you can think of them as matrix operator. And this equation that we have, the Schrodinger equation that we had in initially where the right-hand side was partial, partial T, can be written as this. The left-hand side can be written in terms of a matrix operator times a vector. And here we use direct notation to represent this vector. And you can actually solve this equation in closed form. If you are control theories, this is very similar to what they call the state equation in control theory. Uh, integrating this equation gives you this solution. And what is more important is that this Annihilation and creation operators are known in closed form. Size of n is also known in closed form as we show in the previous slide. You can do by back substitution very easily to show that a hat operating on size of n will give you size of n minus one and a dagger operating on size of n will give you size of n plus. And hence this is also called the lowering operator in addition to the annihilation operator. This is called the creation operator or the lacing, uh, raising operator. And you, of course, I remind you of the fact that size of n has a closed form in the normalized unit. And this is the one which is the one in the lowest energy state. And that when the annihilation operator operates on the ground state, you get zero. And what is more important is that this thing here should operate to become a number operator. Because if you remember the eigenvalue here is n plus half. So this actually turns out to be the number operator with the property the n hat operating on the photon number state gives you back n. So it's kind of confusing here because uh, physicists like to use this kind of very terse notation. Okay, so n hat is actually the number operator, and and so on. So something with a hat is an operator in this course. Uh, so what we have done is actually to raise some of the things that we have in the classical world, like momentum and position, to become operators in the quantum world. That is what Schrodinger did in the very beginning. So one of the things that comes to our mind or that you should know is that uh, observables, which are momentums and positions, become random variables in the quantum world. 
Okay, so here's just an example if a pendulum moving back and forth. In a classical world, you can see precisely where the pendulum is going. Whereas in the quantum world, there's some fuzziness as to when the pendulum is swinging back and forth. And hence, uh, you describe this randomness uh, with a probability density function, which is actually the wave function of the Schrodinger equation. So since this is a probability density function, it should be normalizable. It should be normalized to one. And you can write this normalization condition using the Rex notation, which is that inner product between two vectors. As we, we said before, psi is treated as a vector. And if you write it in linear algebra notation and think of this as a vector, then it says that the inner product between two vectors <coughs> with the complex conjugation, taking one of them, uh, they should normalize to one. So you can use this probability density function to find the average value of X. And this is what we do in probability theory anyhow. And that gives you the average position of X, which I use the notation X bar to denote its average value. It turns out that if you think of X as an operator, so what you do, in getting there is actually to have two vectors sandwiching the operating in between and then do the integration that is what we have on the left-hand side. And if you use linear algebra notation, an operator is a matrix in linear algebra. And if you were to write this up explicitly using linear algebra, it will look something like this. So in addition to having the average of an X operator, you can also have the momentum operator which is now becoming a differential operator in the quantum world in Schrodinger equation. You can define an average of this momentum operator in a similar manner as we did before, okay, which is actually taking two of these functions and multiply them and then sandwiching this in between. And if you were to write this in direct notation, it will look something like this. And if you were to write this in matrix notation, it will look something like this. And what is very important is that both P and X become random variables and their randomness uh, described uh, by these wave functions over here. And the average value of those uh, observables, physicists like to call them observables are given by this equation or this equation over here, depending on which observables you're looking at. Okay, so one key thing is that deterministic variables become random variables in the quantum world. So if you were to think of a pendulum as being analogous to the oscillation of an electric field, what you find is that electric field becomes random in the quantum world. If you were to go to the lab to measure the electric field, it will never come out to be deterministic. It will come out in your measurement to be something like this with a mean and a standard deviation. And here's another example of if you were to measure these quantum signals down to a very low level, you'll find that it's full of noise because there's some uncertainty in the position of this pendulum as it oscillates back and forth. Think of this as the deviation of the pendulum from the main position. And if the thing is not that noisy, you will get something like this. And if it's less noisy, you will get something like this, okay? So the key thing to remember is that things becomes random in the quantum world. So how do we deal with these random variables? Well, uh, there is this operator which represents these observables now in the quantum world. And it turns out that um, we can associate these operators with the uncertainty principle and the computator behavior, okay? For instance, uh, if I have this operator p hat, okay, it's given by this thing over here, um, then because psi is an eigenfunction of p hat, and it becomes a scalar number here, okay, physicists always like to use the same number to denote uh, the operator that you have. So if you walk through the algebra here, this stage becomes here, and then I can take the scalar number out, 
And this size are normalizable functions. So they have unit length and you have this. What it says is that if you are able to prepare a quantum state to be in the eigenstate of the p hat operator, its value can be measured with great certainty. You always, if you were to repeat this experiment over again, the value always comes up to be p, okay? But preparing a system to be in a quantum state, which is the exact eigenfunction of the p hat operator is not trivial. So usually two observable operators do not commute. Like if I have an operator representing the observable P, the other Q hat operator representing the position Q, and if they do not commute, as we know, they do not commute as such. And then if you were to assume that if there is an eigenfunction, that is the eigenfunction of both of them, and if you go through the algebra using this, you can find that since psi is an eigenfunction of this, and then this becomes scalar numbers, and then you get zeros. So this gives rise to a contradiction. So there cannot be such an eigenfunction around. It can be the eigenfunction of both of them, and this is uh, proof by contradiction. So what happens is that if I prepare a quantum state, okay, and if it is in exact eigenfunction of p hat, we can always find this value to be quite deterministic and it's always pn. But quantum state can never be prepared to be in terms of the pure eigenstate. So usually it's a linear superposition of the eigenstate of the operator p hat, okay? And if you go to the algebra, if you go and look at, now if I operate this eigenfunction or I can state with p hat, I get this value over here. And then uh, again, using the fact that p hat times psi sub n is p sub n, and I walk myself through the algebra, I find that the expectation value of p hat now, which is in the linear superposition of the eigenfunction of p hat, okay, can be written in this manner. I go through the algebra because this is orthogonal. Uh, this double summation can become one single summation. And then you have this equation over here, which says that the expectation of a value of a quantum operator usually can be written as a weighted average of the eigenvalues of the operator, where this weights that you find here is the portion of the eigenstate that is in that particular eigenvector. Okay, so this can be given a probabilistic interpretation because the sum of this amplitude square should be one because of the normalization con condition. And hence, the thing is that this quantity is never certain, it becomes random. Different times you do the measurement, you will come up with different values because of the random nature of this. And this applies to the annihilation and creation operator. Uh, they cannot uh, commute and hence they have to be governed by uncertainty principle. So quantum information science. Uh, can you give me just one minute? Okay, let me talk about quantum information science. Uh, well, quantum information science came about because there were two competing schools of thoughts, okay? Uh, one is that we, as we saw in the previous slide, a quantum state can always be written as a linear superposition of the eigenstates of the system, okay? And then when you do a measurement, you do not really know what state the system is. So there are two schools of thought, which is that you do not know what the quantum state is for a quantum system until after you have performed the measurement. 
before the measurement, the quantum system is actually in a linear superposition of states. And when you perform a measurement, the outcome of the experiment can be in any of these quantum states, and they are distributed in a probabilistic fashion according to this equation over here. Okay, as so you see that this has a probabilistic interpretation. Okay, so the Copenhagen School claims that one does not know what a quantum state is until after a measurement, whereas Einstein does not believe that he thinks that a quantum state is known before the measurement. The random nature of the experiment is due to some kind of a hidden variables behind the measurement. Because if you go to the lab and perform measurements, you see things like this, you see things like this. There's some randomness to the nature and Einstein uh, believes that maybe it's, there's some hidden variable somewhere, which is also a random variable that is controlling the outcome. So it turns out that John Bell uh, came up with the theorem of inequality that claims that if the first school of thought is correct, then the equality would be A larger than B, for instance. If the second uh, school of thought is correct, then the inequality would be A less than B, okay? So, but Alan Aspect in 1982 did experiment that confirmed that the Copenhagen School led by Niels Bohr was the correct interpretation, which means that one does not know what the quantum state is before the measurement. Only after the measurement does one know what the quantum state is or what state the quantum system is. Okay. And so if you can uh, think of this equation uh, you do not know what state the quantum system is. It can be in any of these states, okay, according to this uh, probability distribution. So you can think of a quantum particle is like a ghost or an angel. Say if the, the position is the observables that you're after, and its position is not determined, before the measurement, they're like ghosts and angels. You do not know where the ghosts are in the room and you do not know where the angels are in the room until you catch them. And before you catch them, they can be anywhere in the room, okay? This is wonderful for many physicists because this can be used to hide information incognito before a measurement. So if I can use this hide information, I can use that for quantum communication system, okay? There's one very important thing. Another very important thing is that um, if you can get all these states to work in parallel before a measurement, if they're all doing work for you in some fashion, you can have some kind of a quantum parallelism. And that is what quantum computing is uh, based on, quantum parallelism. Instead of say, uh, if you want to solve the problem of a labyrinth or a maze, an ordinary person will have to walk the maze many, many times over before you can find what the solutions is for the best shortest path through a maze, okay? Whereas if you can send a quantum particle, you can be simultaneously everywhere before you do the measurement. Uh, the quantum particle can solve the problem uh, for you very, very quickly, okay? So, so that is the gist of uh, quantum information science. And it displays itself also in a very simple pendulum. So for instance, if I look at this pendulum, classically I know precisely where it is. But what the quantum world is saying is that you do not know precisely where the particle is. The particle can be anywhere where the wave function is not zero, okay? So that is the wonderful thing about uh, this thing. And so I'd like to next show that um, Maxwell's equations can also be derived instead of being determined experimentally. In all our works and our st studies, we say that Maxwell's equations are actually determined experimentally or motivated by experimental outcomes. Okay. But what you can show is that 
Maxwell theory can also be derived um, by using Hamiltonian theory. So let me do that first um, by doing the scalar wave case. And I have to say that Maxwell's equations are nothing but a set of copper harmonic oscillators. Each of them is a pendulum, but if you put many of them together, uh, they can support a wave that propagates in this one dimensional problem. For instance, in two dimension, you can have this harmonic oscillators coupling, uh, coupling wave in two dimensions and also in three dimensions, if you explain this, expand this to three dimensions. So what happens then is that um, I have a Hamiltonian that looks something like this, almost like the classical pendulum that I show you earlier. Okay, uh, I show you this pendulum and it has this only one particle in this system. But if I have many, many of them together, I like to give each particle a position variable, sorry, a position variable plus a momentum variable. And I can say that the Hamiltonian must be something looking like this, where this is a kinetic energy and this must be some kind of a potential energy. So this is the generalization of a simple harmonic oscillator, which is given over here. And then I can derive the Hamiltonian theory for this. And I want the Hamiltonian to be a constant, irrespective of when I move all these particles around, when Q and P change, but the total Hamiltonian does not change. And I can go through the calculus quite easily and show that the equations of motion for each of these particles has to be something like this. And these are independent particles. So when one moves, they can move independently of the other particles and so on. They're also mutually independent. And if you go through the calculus, you can very easily show that using Hamiltonian theory, these are called Hamilton equations, by the way. But if you use Hamilton's equations, you can find that you arrive at these equations over here. And this looks surprisingly like the wave equation because it can combine these two equations and they get this second order things on the left-hand side, and then I have this linear operator on the right-hand side, okay? Which looks very much like the wave equation. And if I further make the assumption that a put a Q, a, a displacement can become a field, I replace the subscript I with a position variable, then this thing becomes a field, what physics is called a field. And then this operator, which maps a field to another field, I can call it the Laplacian operator. I can see that from here, I can derive the scalar wave equation. So this is just an indication that the scalar wave equation can be derived uh, using Hamiltonian theory. But you can generalize this to Maxwell's equations. Of course, the algebra will be a lot more complicated. It's not easy to follow, but if you have the patience you should be able to go through this algebra. And so say, say before, the Hamiltonian of a system is the total energy of the system. And if you assume that mu and epsilon equals one, then you can see that uh, the Hamiltonian is given by this. And if you use the <coughs> vector potential approach, where the H and B are given by the curl of A, and that the electric field is given by the partial derivative of A, uh, uh, then you can you can actually rewrite this thing in this manner, okay? You can rewrite this thing in this manner. Um, and we can call this the electric field and so on. And you can show that this is like a pendulum. This can be thought of as some kind of a potential energy. And this part is something like the kinetic energy. So it's the elevated kind of pendulum a set of copper harmonic oscillator. And we use the phi equal to zero gauge to make things simpler. And we use the Coulomb's gauge to make things simpler. And then if you now um, take the variation or take the derivative of this uh, Hamiltonian with respect to the conjugate variables, these are like what we call the conjugate variables, the position and the momentum, like the pendulum case, and you can arrive at this Hamilton equations for multi-dimensions, okay? It's not easy to see, but it is analogous to what we have done before. And I'm doing this for the discrete case where the position variables are all discrete, okay? 
And when position variables are discrete, you can write this down quite easily. It's only when the position variable becomes a continuum, then this actually becomes a function. Okay, this becomes a function. Instead of doing a simple derivative, you actually have to do a functional derivative. It's something that you can learn quite easily. I don't think most people know it, but you can learn very easily from our papers. So these Hamilton equations are now expressed in terms of functional derivatives. And if you know how to swing the mathematics underneath all of this, you can show that starting with this Hamiltonian, you can actually derive Maxwell's equations. And you can derive the vector wave equation. And also by using this relationship, you can derive both Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Okay. So, so those was that was purely classical. In the classical world, we can derive Maxwell's equation from a classic Hamiltonian, but it will be interesting to see what we can do with the quantum Hamiltonian. Because in the quantum world, we have you will have to replace the classical Hamiltonian with the quantum Hamiltonian. And if you look at uh, as to what we have done in the past, when you have a Schrodinger equation, uh, we have this thing that we, let me see, was it here? No, here. Yeah, here. We have this, uh, what we call the quantum state equation. And people in control theory knows that you can solve this equation in closed form, as long as each hat is a constant. Okay, and it also applies for a general Hamiltonian for a very complex system like the Hamiltonians that we have derived here. Uh, so we're going to elevate them and make them into quantum systems. So in general, if you know the Hamiltonian of a system, you can solve for the quantum state equation. The quantum state equation can give you the time evolution operator times the quantum state at t equal to zero. So if you look at this, then in quantum theory, we say that if you have an observable, if you want to find out what it is, you actually have to find its expectation value, which is like taking the average of this observable. Okay. However, you can write this observable in two ways, or write this expectation value in two ways. That is now if you substitute this side sub t with this equation over here, you get another way of expressing this observable equation in its average. And if you were to now, uh, of course, this is just a more compact way of writing this equation where O sub H is what we call the observable or the operator in the Heisenberg picture. And o sub S is the observable or the operator in the Schrodinger picture. You can differentiate this observable or this operator quite easily and find that it becomes something like this, a straightforward, uh, derivation. And you can show that this is just a simple commutator. Okay. So what is more interesting is that if you now apply this equation, which is called a Heisenberg equation of motion to the momentum operator P hat, you get this equation. This is just a straightforward substitution. And then you can also apply this equation to the position operator Q hat, and you get this other equation of motion. And it turns out that you can show by repeated use of the commutator that this can be written as such, okay? And then if you repeatedly use the commutator, uh, you can show that this can be simplified as such. <clears throat> so what is amazing is that even for the simple pendulum, you have this Hamilton equations and they look strikingly similar to the classical Hamilton equations. Hamilton derived these equations ages ago, okay? But there is a quantum version of Hamilton equations. And I say that Hamilton will be rolling happily in this grave if he knows that his equations are also valid for the quantum work. So this is just for a very simple single pendulum, okay? so. You can go from a single pendulum to multiple pendulum, a set of couple harmonic oscillators. Then you get these Hamilton's equations in the continuum more. And because of the homomorphism or the analogy between classical and quantum, 
whatever you see in the classical world, you can pretty much repeat in the quantum world. So if you know how to repeat, if you know how to do this in the classical world, you would know that this equation exists in the quantum world. Well, all these are now quantum operators because in the quantum Hamiltonian, as I said before, you would have to elevate um, If you have this classical Hamiltonian, if you want to make this quantum, you want to make this P uh, operator, and you also want to make this X uh, operator, it turns out that making X an operator is trivial. So usually people don't do that. So if you want to derive quantum Maxwell's equations, we have to take all the conjugate variables that we have identified and elevate them to be operators. Okay, so if you do that, then the, the Hamiltonian will become very complicated. But if you go through the same process of derivation, you will find that there's a quantum Maxwell's equations that is very similar to the classical Maxwell's equations. Okay, and the derivations of this uh, quantum Maxwell's equations are given in our paper. You can read them, and if you have any questions, you can always ask us by email. Okay, so the wonderful thing is that these Hamiltonians are very complicated. They're not like that of a simple pendulum. And yet these equations can be solved in formally enclosed form. Okay, so, so the last topic I'd like to talk about is actually discussing on how a photon can be riding on a plane wave mode. And if you look at most textbooks, Deriving this is very difficult in most textbooks. Instead, instead of deriving them from first principle, I like to motivate them. And let's look at a plane wave mode in the classical world. One way of writing this plane wave mode is to say that if this is real value on the left, it should be this value plus its complex conjugation. Okay, you can do the same thing for electric field, for instance, it will be just derivative of this vector potential plus its complex conjugation. So now you can take these classical values, which we are very familiar with, that most of us are very familiar with, okay? And convert that into a pointing power or time average power density. And you say that if this really is going to denote something quantum, okay, it's not quantum yet, but at least the correspondence principle should hold true. And this energy flux should be proportional to the number of photons times the energy per photon, which has been found to be h bar omega, times the velocity of these photons. Okay, this actually should hold true if this is true. So one way to make sure that this thing holds true is to pick this amplitude to have something like this. So if there are n photons in this wave function or wave, plane wave, then the amplitude has to have something like this, except for a phase that we cannot determine, okay? Then if I plug this back in here, the hypothesis that I had originally can be written in this fashion. So it's more suggestive of a bunch of photons traveling uh, together, but this is purely a classical picture. There's not nothing quantum. I'm using the hindsight that this has to correspond to a stream of particles, okay? So I can again write this into a term that consists of the positive frequency part and a term that corresponds to the negative frequency part. And the two are always complex conjugation of each other, okay? These are called analytic signal. <clears throat> because they're complex conjugation of each other, you can multiply them quite easily together you can find that the power density that corresponds to this plane wave is given by this, which is what we have expected, okay? We have taken N over V, okay, to be uh, capital N over here, okay? Uh, so, so N is actually the number of photons that we have in the system, okay? For unit volume and so on. So, I'm going to elevate this field into operators without a long derivation, because if you have to read most textbooks, getting here is quite difficult. I'm going to physically motivate it anyhow. 
saying that if I know that the classical plane wave is going to be looking like this, if this is going to be a quantum plane wave, it has to be an operator. That's what we have learned. We have to make all fields becoming to become operators. So one simple way that I can make it into an operator is to put the annihilation operator over here. Okay. And then I can write the negative frequency part in this manner and ask three questions. First, do I get the correspondence limit? Uh, that is, if this photon, uh, this wave function is carrying a huge number of photons, do I get back the classical limit? Okay. And the second question I ask myself, by elevating this into a quantum operator, do I make this into a random field? Okay, in a little while you will find that this field is actually random. It's not deterministic anymore, okay? And um, it has to satisfy the correspondence limit and so on. I, I guess here are the three things. If you plug this equation back into quantum Maxwell's equations that we have derived, does it satisfy that equation? Okay, does it have the randomness hypothesis? Is the randomness of the field built in here? It will build in there if I let this operator operating on a quantum state. Okay, I will explain this quantum state later on. And you can also show that uh, this field operator constructed in this manner would satisfy the quantum state equation because you can actually derive the Hamiltonian from this uh, Field operator quite easily, but I don't have time to derive them, so I just motivate them. Okay, so so the thing is that um, you can generalize this field operators to that of uh, two polarizations rather than just one polarization. In this one over here, it very much is very classical experience uh, in appearance, other than this operator over here. And if you take the homogeneous conjugate of this operator, it becomes the, the, uh, the creation operator. And this is the annihilation operator and so on, okay? So it will look something like this in conjugate pair, okay? So, so this is something very classical and very familiar to us. The only thing that's not familiar to us is this operator over here. So we would definitely know that this would satisfy quantum Maxwell's equations, okay? How does the randomness come about? Well, these are uh, quantum operators. They have to operate on a quantum state. Let me assume that the quantum state that we have consists of only one photon. The photon is jumping back and forth between the horizontal and the polar right, and the, and the horizontal and the vertical polarization. So it has two quantum states, okay? <clears throat> the photons are either in this quantum state or in this quantum state, which is the product state of the vertical photon and the horizontal photon. And these two things have to add up to one when you square their amplitude. So the randomness will come from this quantum state. And if you look at the polarization of this field, it becomes random. And the most important thing is that it is random. And you do not know which polarization the photon is until after the measurement. That is what the measurement hypothesis in the quantum interpretation, in the, in, the, in the Copenhagen School of Thought, you do not know where the photon is before the measurement, okay? You can let this photon write on this wave and you can hide information with these two photons, okay? That is very important. So you can have a, experiment where the photons come out to be either horizontally polarized or vertically polarized, but it can be also in the linear superposition of a horizontal polarization and vertical polarization. Essentially, if, if only one photon, you can think of that photon has been flipping back and forth between these two states, okay? And it's completely random and you do not know what polarization that photon is. So if you use a beam splitter, you'll find that uh, in this experiment, a 50% chance that the photon will be, will be vertically polarized, and then 50% chance that the photon will be horizontally polarized. Because of this, you can actually 
use this for the famous uh, Alice and Bob experiment. You have them hold up different polarizations and the combinations here are too complicated to talk about. I will not talk about in detail, but you get the idea that because you do not know which photons will be coming about when you detect them, it can be either one of the photons. Uh, this photon can either go this way or that way and it can make the communication very secure. And there's also something called a known, no cloning theorem, which says that uh, you cannot steal this photon and clone it so that you can, you can um, cheat and, and you can cheat. There's a, a girl by the name of Eve, who is always in between these two measurement systems between Alice and Bob. She cannot take a photon, clone it, and then send the photon along so as to confuse Alice and Bob about this uh, communication system. That is called the no cloning uh, system, okay? So, so as I said before, the one photon state is a linear superposition of uh, vertical and polarization. If you were to measure the horizontal polarization, you will come up with this probability. And if you were to measure the vertical polarization, you will come up with this probability. And because these are two probabilistic amplitudes, they have to add up to one. So this is like a whirlwind tour of uh, quantum technology and how we make Maxwell's equations become quantum and fields becomes operators, okay? So the most important thing is that whatever you observed, like the electric field and the magnetic field, they become random variables. You can say that they are homomorphic to a pendulum. You can think of the oscillation of a pendulum being, being analogous to the oscillation of the electromagnetic field in a cavity or the electromagnetic field in a plane wave. And when whatever becomes random in the oscillator becomes random in a cavity field, okay? And this area is rather thin on knowledge. You will find that there are not too many papers written on the, this and if you try to read them, you will probably find them quite difficult to digest, okay? And so if we can gain a quantum advantage and we will make quantum communication very secure and we will make quantum computers really fast and we will make quantum sensing to be highly sensitive. Then something that I haven't talked about is quantum entanglement. And I hope that this course can stimulate your interest in this area. And, and I think uh, Dr. Na will talk a little bit about quantum entanglement. Another one is quant uh, quantum squeezing of light, where you can use that to improve the signal to noise. As you can see, these things are very noisy. Okay, you can use squeezing of light to improve the signal to noise ratio of these things. Okay, let me see. Yeah, here are some of the papers we've written on this topic. Uh, we'll be happy to communicate with you, discuss things with you, because I think this is a difficult area to understand. Uh, and it's rather confound, confounding. And it's almost like Zen Buddhism, I would say. Uh, things do not become clear on first reading. And I'll stop here because I think my time is almost up. We have maybe a uh, five minutes break and two minutes discussion if you want to. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Professor Fu. Yes, for the audience, you can, uh, if you have any question, please, uh, you can either type in the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself, you can ask question. Okay, let me see, I can see three chats. I don't have any questions in the thing, am I right? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any question in the set, chat session. Hey, I have a quick question. Sure. 
Uh, so my question is actually regarding slide 14. Yes, well, slide 14, let me go back to slide 14. So here you picked a gauge and then you proceeded from there. I was wondering if the concept of gauge invariance is something that you assume beforehand or if that's something that can also be sort of arrived at? Uh, it turns out that we pick the phi equal to zero gauge. And if you pick phi equal to zero gauge, it turns out that Lorentz gauge and Coulomb's gauge are the same, okay? And that makes the mathematics a lot simpler. And we have been studying this. It turns out that there is a large class of problem where you can actually set phi equal to zero, greatly simplifying things. But there are some problems you cannot set phi equal to zero. Then you will have to work with the full gauge where you have phi not equal to zero, a not equal to zero, okay? Um, yeah, I, I would say that a problem, a, a good physics problem should be gauge invariant because it, uh, choosing the gauge does not decide on the outcome of the E field and the H field. And as physicists always say, in the laboratory, you mentioned the E field and the H field. They should be invariant with respect to the gauge that you choose. Is that what you mean? Yeah, sort of. I, I guess I was sort of asking like, if gauge, like you picked a certain gauge and then you derived Maxwell's equations from them. And I'm guessing that if you picked a different gauge, you would be able to get to the same result, but the math might be harder. The is math that... would be a lot more complicated. Okay. We the gauge so that the math is very simple and manageable. Okay. Okay. Thank it's you. Hard to present this course with a complicated gauge or general gauge. All right. Thanks. Any, any other questions? I have a follow-up question. Okay, sure. Uh, so Wait, my, uh, the same about- you want, to, you want to show your face or you do not want oh, to? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from uh, Canada as well, from uh, as well as Shashwat. Oh, okay. Not far from us. Uh, Nice to meet you. And uh, I was I was wondering about this. Uh, so, like a follow up question. You said that phi equals zero gauge. So, is this an approximation to make phi equals zero, or is this? Um... Well, uh, it turns out that there are many problems where phi equal to zero gauge is exact. Uh huh. And there's no error being made, but there's mm -hmm. some problems you cannot ignore phi. Right. I think we are writing a paper on that. I think one of my students is also presenting a paper on this topic. So oh. we can make phi equal to zero and phi not equal to zero. Oh, okay. Like in this conference. Yeah, in this conference. Ah, thank you. Yeah, some people call this the radiation gauge. Ah. Because when you have divergence of A equal to zero, the field is transverse. And this happens to a wave in the far field. If you mm -hmm. it transfers and then you can set P equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Radiation field and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good question. A very okay. nice question. Any other questions? If not, then we, we shall give you a five minutes break and you come back after five minutes. How about that? Okay, you come back after five minutes. Okay, then I'll resume around uh, 22. Yeah, 22, okay. You can use your own slides. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, yeah, I'll close uh, my slides. Yeah, but it's true, you have to stop sharing. Okay, I stop share. Maybe I can try to share my screen. Um, can you see my full screen or is there something else? 
Yes, we, uh, uh, we can see your screen. Okay, yeah, that's great. Yeah, so for a better visual effect, you can uh, turn on your laser pointer so that it is a uh, red color is more high attractive. Yes, yeah, that is looks much better. Okay, um, can I start? I guess you can start, right? Shudong can, can long up start. I guess you can start, yeah. Okay, so this is full screen mode. Can you see my own screen? Okay, so then let me get started. So hello everyone. Um, welcome to the second part of the short course on quantum Maxwell's equations and quantum electromagnetics. Uh, my name is Dong Ma. I am currently research scientist at Purdue University in electrical and computer engineering, uh, working with Professor Wang Chu and Professor Thomas Wall. So from the first part, we've seen uh, an overview on the quantum electromagnetics and the relevant math and physics model. So actually the second part of this short, short course uh, is designed uh, to give you more specific ideas how to specific and uh, numerically um, calculate and model and predict a variety of uh, quantum electromagnetic phenomena. Uh, from that uh, math and physics model. So um, this is the outline of my talk. Um, so I'll start with brief introduction, highlighting what would be 
classic, what would be the difference between the classical and quantum electromagnetics? And um, uh, what we need to do for uh, studying quantum electromagnetics. And then we'll uh, briefly go over the procedure of quantization of multi mode EM field uh, with so called occupation number representation, which uses the annihilation operator and creation operator that we've seen in the first part. And then I'll uh, give you. Um, some um, contents on then how to model quantum state of non-classical light, uh, for example, the single photon or entangled photon, and also importantly, how to model the photo detection pr process and um, extract the meaningful information in the form of coincidence. And then we'll move on to the quantization um, through the numerical mode composition for dispersive and inhomogeneous electric medium. And then I'll provide two numerical simulations, um, uh, which are for the Hong or Mandel effect and non-local dispersion cancellation. And then I'll summarize my talk uh, and with uh, some several take home messages. So then, um, then what is the difference between the classical and um, quantum electromagnetic field. So uh, imagine a uh, classical electromagnetic scattering problem uh, figure on the left. We may have an incident field that may be plane wave or Gaussian beam pulse. Then these fields are gonna be scattered by scatter uh, that can be modeled by well-known the effective permittivity or permeability, then it will generate the scattered field. So we may want to um, measure the field by using the receiver antennas. And also we can simulate this kind of scattering process uh, by using numerical method in computational electromagnetics. For example, the finite element method, uh, method of moment um, based on the classical Maxwell's, equ Maxwell's equations. So the, the thing is that actually the field, field are basically the scalar values for a given position and frequency. Furthermore, if we write this field in terms of eigen mode, uh, plane wave, for example, for the free space, then we, know we have a, a control in this modal amplitude denoted by uh, tilde G. And this value actually is continuous variable so that uh, res resultant EM energies continues at every single frequency. However, we've seen in the first part that um, basically quantum electromagnetic field, whenever we take a measurement on this QEM field, we have a, a random result so that we need um, operator and vector concept to model this uh, physics. And also the EM energy it's not going to be continuous at frequency anymore. So it's going to be discrete. And the carrier carrying the least amount of EM energy, uh, which is H, uh, H uh, this is the Planck constant. Planck constant times the uh, frequency is called the photon. And also, uh, we may not have some continuous voltage signal in our antenna. Uh, when taking a measurement on this QEM field, but uh, we need to do the single photon detection, single photo detection, and that provides a binary kind of result, click or not. So we just know uh, whether or not the photo, single photon is present. Uh, we, we should um, extract more meaningful information in the form of coincidence from between the multi uh, photo detection. So, and also important question is that do we, uh, it is still possible for us to use the concept of effective permittivity to model the scattering by these materials. So then the, we're gonna answer, we're gonna see the proper method and physics model for this QM field and um, try to answer um, still possible to use the numerical method in CEM. And about the, um, possibility of using effective permittivity. Um, so basically all matter consists of a lot of atoms um, with this lattice constant so that the, um, 
the scientists in scientists um, try to uh, analyze this QEM field taking the so-called microscopic approach in which all matters degrees of freedom are explicitly accounted for so that it's going to be very expensive and also impractical uh, when a lot of matters are present. So the other competing approach is called a macroscopic uh, QM theory in which we can use the effective medium um, this permeability, permittivity and permeability. Actually, this macroscopic QM theory is valid as long as the wavelength of the photon is much larger than the lattice constant. And then we aggregating aggregating effects of atoms in an average sense. So that's going to be more practical approach. So then what are the applications of this macroscopic quantum electromagnetic theory uh, in which deals with the interaction between photons and some electric material? One is the optical quantum computer. Uh, in recently, the a Chinese group shows the uh, performance of their optical quantum computer based on the um, optical fountain, photon. Uh, the other quantum computer actually that uses micro wave single photon developed by Google and IBM. But this optical quantum computer has an advantage that um, since the energy of the optical photon has a larger than large is larger than the microwave photon. So in principle, it can operate at uh, room temperature. And also it uses a lot of the passive optical component, for example, the beam splitter or phase shifter. Um, so that the um, it is important to analyze the interaction between the photons and then uh, the electric material. But at the end, in order to commercialize this kind of some um, bulky optical circuit, the miniaturization is important. Uh, to do this, to do this, we may able to use the quantum plasmonics and quantum metal surfaces actively ongoing. Um, and also in another important um, application is quantum imaging or radar systems that uh, um, it actually have, can have the super resolution or higher sensitivity than uh, that of classical uh, imaging systems by using entangled photon. So this is the scope of uh, problems that we want to address in this talk. So we have a scatter uh, described by this uh, effective permittivity. Then we have an incident, uh, single photons or entangled photons. Then we want to measure um, single uh, photo detections at different places. And eventually, we want to extract in, um, meaningful information uh, from these uh, multi-photo detections. So we have uh, four questions. For example, uh, first, how to quantize EM field, uh, arbitrarily the electric material. And the second question, how to model the quantum state um, of the non-classical light, again, the single photon or entangled photon. Third question, how to model the single photo detection and coincidence. And lastly, how to calculate all these kind of things in a uh, quantitative sense all based on the, throughout this talk, all based on the Heisenberg picture where uh, operators time evolve, whereas the quantum state remains to be time uh, invariant. Then we, uh, let's begin with uh, a simpler case of the quantization of multi-mode EM field, this one dimensional um, hollow cavity. The first step is to revisit EM theory, classical EM theory in the Hamiltonian framework, just uh, analyzing their energy. Energy or Hamiltonian will be given by the volume integral of the field squared. Then our objective as seen in the first part, our objective is to make the form of this Hamiltonian mathematically homomorphic 
to that of a mechanical harmonic oscillator, this kind of quadratic forms with respect to position and the momentum. To do this, we first uh, expand the field in terms of eigenmode. Since the eigenmode of this cavity would be trigonometric function, then we can write um, the field in this form and by using mode orthonormality, then this volume integral can be uh, rewritten by a single summation with respect to this Q, where Q is the modal amplitude of eigenmode. J um, index refers to index of eigenmode of this system. You can see that um, there is a homomorphism between these two um, expression. But what's more important thing is to interpret this Q. Actually, this Q is the modal amplitude of this electric field, not uh, the exact the position or momentum, but actually their roles are same uh, as the mechanical harmonic oscillator position and momentum. So we usually call this Q and P as a generalized position and momentum. And since we have a summation, we can interpret uh, this physical picture as a kind of sum of a lot of uncoupled harmonic oscillators, okay? Actually, uh, this kind of process, I mean, the fields are expressed by eigenfunction so that their solution space um, is spanned by these eigenmodes are called the first diagonalization. And for later, uh, we'll see why we uh, use another variable A and A complex conjugate, uh, which correspond to the annihilation and creation operator. But actually in the classical level, they just uh, represent the complex valued model amplitude uh, given by this linear superposition of the real valued uh, or generalized position and momentum. And then we let these um, position and momentum variables into operators by invoking commutator relations, which is again uh, closely related to Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And we uh, will go arrive at this kind of Hamiltonian operator. And again, we introduced a new kind of operator, annihilation operator, and the creation operator with this linear superposition. And that uh, we can show that this kind of um, commutator relations for A and A decker operator from this original commutator. And then we can write the Hamiltonian uh, as a summation of the A decker and A plus some identity operator. And also the electric field operator will be um, can be written by the, again, the eigenfunction expansion, but the model classical model amplitude are replaced by A and A degree operator. And we were able to derive the Hamiltonian operator with this form, but the operator itself does not have any physical meaning. It just uh, transfers some um, vector to another vector. So that in order for us to have more um, significant physical meaning, we need the eigenvector to be acted on this Hamiltonian operator. So the, the step, the looking for the eigenstate of this Hamiltonian is called the second diagonalization. And we've seen in this first part that this number operator has a eigenstate in the form of this cat N it's called the folk state or a photon number state. So that, um, and this folk state has an orthonormal properties in terms of their eigenmode indices and uh, photon number M and N. And why it's called the annihilation and creation and uh, lowering and uh, raising operators that Actually, you can interpret this uh, cat n folk state as a the photon n number of photons are occupied in jth eigenmode, and you can 
if we act the annihilation operator on this state, it reduces photon number by one. So that's why we call the lowering operator. Whereas this creation operator increased the photon number by one. Actually, this kind of um, algebra will be intensively used in uh, this talk on numerical simulations. And then let me um, describe then how to model the quantum state of single photon. We can start with uh, the monochromatic single photon, meaning that the single photon is occupied in J eigenmode. You know it by the side. Then if you look at this expression, just one, again, occupied in J mode, and you can also rewrite this one as the creation operator acting on the vacuum state. The vacuum state refers to um, the state, uh, there's no photon in any eigenmode, but this creation operator for J eigenmode will increase the photon number by one. Okay. And also we can build the quantum state of quasi monochromatic single photon, meaning that um, the single photon may be occupied in a lot of eigenmode, multi-mode with different probabil probability amplitude. So that uh, uh, we will see that this single photon, I mean, quantum state will describe the single photon spatially localized uh, in the uh, writing on our wave packet. And also we can build a quantum state for two photons. If two photons are independent to each other, we can first build their uh, individually, their quantum state, and then uh, we can use the tensor product between them so that we have a composite quantum state. So, um, now we uh, were able to write the electric field operator with eigenmode and annihilation operators and quantum state with probability amplitude and creation operator acting on vacuum state. So this eigenmode and lettering process will be important to uh, calculate this kind of um, thing. Actually, then how to model the photo detection process. The physically speaking uh, photo detection happens when um, atom, atom absorbs the photon um, so that the atom will be excited from the ground to the excited state. So that can be modeled by the action of the annihilation or lowering operator on quantum state so that it decreases photon number by one. Uh, yeah, so we have a vacuum state. In addition to that, we will account for the probability of photo detection at a certain location and time instant. And that is that can be considered by eigenmode of this um, electric field operator. And actually, this alpha embed all the information of eigenmode, the specific location and time, so that um, if we use if we to the algebra of this uh, creation and annihilation operator, we end up in this expression, the vacuum state with a uh, certain complex value alpha. So from this, we uh, can take the comp complex conjugate inner product for this uh, quantum state, and then we can have the photo detection probability in this. And also, we can calculate kind of coincident between two photo detections. Suppose that uh, we we are trying to detect photon at this and this locations with different time. It can be modeled by twice actions of electric field operator on quantum state. So that in this case, I assume that the there are two photons, so that you have a double summations and double. Um, twice action of creation operator on vacuum state with uh, probability amplitude and alpha and beta uh, incorporate the eigenmode information at different locations in time. Then we, we can write the whole thing uh, looking complicated in this expression, but 
we can repeat to use the bosonic commutator and um, some the lettering operation process, we then we uh, were we will be able to arrive at this vacuum state with certain value again. So then the call incident probability will be given by just the square of modulus of this gamma. And also um, this the second order correlation, which is widely in widely used in quantum optics. Uh, is defined by denoted by G two is defined by coincident uh, normalized some um, proper constant, but essentially uh, it refers to coincident probability of coincident between two photo detections. And then I'll I'll talk about the quantum entanglement a little bit. The we can um, in a Simply speaking, quantum entanglement refers to uh, non-local strong correlation between the state of two systems. For example, imagine we um, created a pair of photons entangled in terms of polarization, meaning that um, they propagate, one of them propagate to the left, one of them propagate to the right uh, with uncertainty of polarization, but as soon as we measure one of photon, um, left photon, then suppose we had the vertical polarization, then regardless of how far they are separated, the other photon state will be automatically determined as in the form of the uh, horizontal polarization. So they show a strong anti-correlation uh, in a non-local sense. So again, uh, their long history as Professor Chu described in the first part, hyper paradox, hidden variable theory, and Bell's inequality. But there's no classical counterpart uh, about this entanglement. Actually, um, using this strong correlation, uh, this strong correlation in entangled photon can be used to beat uh, environmental noise. So it, it is very promising for quantum imaging and radar system. That means um, in principle, regardless um, how large the environmental noise is, even if our signal is buried in the noise uh, signal, we can um, we can detect a, a single photon or one of entangled photon using this strong correlation. There are a lot of physical quant that you, we can use to make the quantum entanglement, for example, polarization, um, path, and energy time. From the mathematical viewpoint, uh, if we want to make the quantum state of two photons, the non-entangled case, if you double summation with double actions of creation operator, it is separable for non-entangled case so that um, it is very similar concept to the separation of variable, but in tangled case, the probability amplitude cannot be separated. So that's the mathematical, the way of mathematical modeling of entangled photons. So then let's move on to the quantization of EM field in dispersive and inhomogeneous media. As seen in the uh, previous slide, the underlying principle of quantization of EM field um, is to find eigen mode of the system. For example, if we have a lossless and dispersionless in homogeneous media, so that the permittivity is a function of space, in principle, we can find the um, eigen mode of the system. For example, uh, we can use the numerical method. Then we have a finite um, dimensional linear system, just the um, the AXB equation describing this Hel um, the Helmholtz wave equation. But how about the dispersive media? So that permittivity is actually the function of space. If we use the Lorentz Sommerfeld uh, Drit model like this, uh, then the whole equations is going to be the implicit eigenvalue problem, meaning that the arbitrarily ordered polynomial eigenvalue problem. So 
it is not easy to uh, solve that um, polynomial eigenvalue problem. So we would like to derive the standard eigenvalue problem by taking, uh, by considering the explicit coupling between EM fields and polarization field P inside the medium. And then we want to uh, do the first diagonalization of this explicit model. Then I'll highlight just the big idea of this quantization procedure. You can start from the Maxwell's equations, um, Faraday's law and uh, Ampere's law and additional equation describing the, the, um, the polarization vector. And omega p is the plasma frequency and omega naught is the resonant frequency. Omega p is kind of coupling coefficient between the polarization field and electromagnetic field. And then we will deal with the vector potential instead of ENH and the P field. Again, in order to use the Hamiltonian framework, we first um, need to define the generalized position or canonical position and momentum variable. So the canonical uh, position variable would be A and P the momentum variables uh, is defined in this way, time derivative n minus p and time derivative p. And then um, we can write the Hamiltonian with um, some lengthy manipulation, but essentially it's big, it uh, represents the Hamiltonian, the total Hamiltonian consists of the vector potential part and polarization part and interaction part. Then we can derive the Hamilton equations of motion in this first order time derivative of four equations, but basically multivariables then hard to derive the Hermitian eigenvalue problem. So what we did is to, is to define the new canonical position and momentum variable uh, in this um, form. It's called a canonical transformation the new canonical variables are defined by just the uh, linear superposition of the original position and momentum operators. Then we can compactly write the Hamiltonian in this block matrix form. You can see that the QP is actually the quadratic form. And then we can also write the Hamiltonian equations in motion. From this, uh, we can derive the generalized Hermitian eigenvalue problem, which is explicit eigenvalue problem, so that um, we have a mode orthonormal properties uh, this way. That means that uh, we can find the eigenmode of this system, then Hamiltonian will be diagonalized by the complex valued amplitude. It's the first diagonal diagonalization so that we can follow the uh, subsequent quantization procedure uh, as done for the mechanical harmonic oscillator. So that the vector potential can be uh, expanded by eigenmode and uh, ampli modal amplitude. So this is the um, schematic illustrating what happens in the first diagonalization we have seen in the previous life. So before diagonalization, um, vector potentials and polarization fields are coupled to each other and their coupling is described by kind of string some picture. And after first diagonalization, we have a lot of independent or uncoupled harmonic oscillators. In this case, each harmonic oscillator describes the modal amplitude of the eigenmode. So the Hamiltonian again um, is diagonalized in this form. Then actually it is very difficult to solve this um, Hermitian eigenvalue problem. So we have possibility to use numerical um, computational electromagnetic method, finite difference method or finite element method. So then we have, we can, we can convert this infinite dimensional some system into the finite dimensional one so that it is solvable, just the matrix equation. 
and also the con continuous eigenmode index omega and lambda. Lambda refers to the degeneracy index at a uh, single frequency is converted by a single uh, discrete eigenmode index j so that um, vector potential can be expanded by single summation with this eigen numerical eigenmode and the annihilation operator. We're gonna use this numerical method for um, subsequent numerical simulations. So uh, this is the, um, so I'm gonna, from this, I'm gonna show you two, two numerical examples of quantum electromagnetic phenomena. One is the uh, hong o Mandel effect. The whole Mandel effect is widely used in quantum optics uh, to measure um, the extent of indistinguishability of two photons, meaning that how similar they are, for example, in terms of their frequency or a bandwidth or polarization. So then let's so let, let's consider the classical case. So we have a beam splitter. If we send the classical um, light, for example, uh, laser beams, then by properly engineering this beam splitter, we can make only uh, one of output pore. We have a non-zero uh, light in a deterministic sense. Never happens um, the other output pore, I mean, non-zero light intensity. However, in the quantum case, our quantum case, um, when sending two single photons into the same beam splitter, they exit through the beam splitter while bunch, but uh, they only they appear they appear on either output ports in a random sense or uh, 50 uh, probability. This is because they are actually uh, path entangled, showing a strong anti-correlation in photo detections and um, along both paths. Um, what that means is actually whenever you have a single photo detection on one path, for example, up um, path then the other photon, this right path, always have a zero photon. And the generation of this path entangled photons can be explained by the destructive interference of the photo uh, two photons inside the beam splitter. And then we'll simulate uh, this interesting effect in our numerical simulations based on the math and physics model developed before. So then to occur the uh, destructive interference in the beam splitter, we first designed the 50-50 beam splitter with equal uh, magnitude of reflection, reflectance and transmittance with um, 90 degree of the relative phase difference. Then we first designed the dispersionless uh, beam splitter. The design beam splitter shows the 50-50 uh, performance um, when omega is equal to around the 526 uh, times speed of light, approximately 9.5% uh, of the fractional bandwidth. So that um, this is gonna be our um, dispersionless beam splitter used in our simulation and then we start include uh, dispersion into this uh, beam splitter uh, by modeling the relative uh, permittivity with this uh, um, droids Lorentz sum of that model. And the, the thing is that this omega p determines the extent of dispersion. If we let this value um, be lower, then uh, we have more dispersion effects so that the fractional bandwidth of this 50-50 beam splitter performance will be narrower than the dispersion in this case. And then we wanna see then how this dispersion effect will come to, um, will be, will perturb the Hong Mandel um, effect of the dispersion list case. So then we wanna, then now we model the initial quantum state of two incident single photons. So it is assumed that each single photon is a quasi-monochromatic, meaning that riding a wave packet, and they are supposed to be initialized from the left right to, and then propagate toward the beam splitter in the middle. By the way, this is the one-dimensional simulations. And also, uh, when the separation distance um, 
is exactly same, then they will have an exactly same arrival time to this beam splitter, so that they have a uh, they can have a perfect interference inside the beam splitter. Um, but we actually uh, perturb the init lo initial localization position of the white photon by delta x, so that there would be tau amount of tau of the time mismatching between um, the arrival times of two photons. And then after interference, when we may have some scatter photon field, and we wanna we may we take the photo detections at both outputs one and two, then calculate the coincidence or G2 correlation with respect to this time, time mismatching or time difference. It's defined again that A uh, over BC, um, where A, B, C are defined over here, A just basically tells the coincidence between these two photo detections with respect to this um, initial quantum state. These are just the um, normalization constant. And again, um, we have used the numerical eigen mode uh, for this electric field operator. Um, and then we did some lettering uh, process, process algebra to calculate A, B, C. Then this is the result, uh, time difference or uh, time mismatching between arrival photon times uh, versus G2 correlation. Let's first look at the case, uh, this person list case illustrated by uh, circles. You can see that um, almost zero um, for smaller tau, but the means is the photons experience the perfect interference that, and um, they get um, path entangled at output pole so that there's no coincidence. However, when time difference increases, then um, mismatching happens so that they do not have interference so that um, we can have a coincidence. So this is the Hong O Mandel effect. And if we um, start considering the effect of dispersion, then um, you can see that as the extent of dispersion increases, then this um, G2 has a little bit larger values against the zero. Then also it has a wider width of the um, Hong Mandel curves. That is kind of a typical symptom of this Persian effect, making uh, the quality factor lower down. So it coincides with that uh, argument. And um, another numerical example that I like to show you is non-local dispersion cancellation. So in classical theory, actually, there's no way of canceling out the dispersion effect. For example, you can imagine the wave propagation inside the dispersive media, then um, a wave always gets dispersive. But in quantum regime, um, when an entangled photons propagate through the two different dispersive media, and their coincident pick between these uh, photo detections um, can be kept to be uh, that of the free space propagation as of there's no medium. So that first proposed by Franson in 1992, it's been of great, great interest for uh, quantum communication, particularly uh, long distance quantum communication to compensate the loss of entanglement during the the propagation inside this person optical fibers. And there are a lot of studies on this um, topic, but among them, the recent experiment demonstration uh, done by a, a Chinese group um, achieved by um, a very um, nice result that um, the, the situation is that the, again, the two photons are, entangled photons are generated and the length of optical fibers were around like a few tens of kilometers. They also tried to measure the coincident. You can see uh, first in this figure, the time um, difference versus coincident for free space, there's no medium and the 
coincident peak. Width of coincident peak was around the thir thir 37 uh, picosecond. But after introducing uh, two different dispersive media, SMF or DCF, um, if we introduce this one-sided dispersive media uh, illustrated by this blue um, triangle and circle, then the, the coincident peak gets dispersed like a 10 times larger um, or 166 picosecond. But if we introduce uh, both sided dispersive optical fibers, then we can reduce the uh, width of this coincident peak significantly. So this is non-local dispersion cancellation. So to do this, uh, we need energy time entangled photons. So let me briefly describe what that is. So basically it, it, it has a strong correlation uh, in a non-local sense between energy uh, and time. So when consider three level atom, uh, when a pump laser shines this three level atom, which is initially um, in the ground state and it will be excited. And as time flows due to the vac uh, vacuum fluctuations make transition from excited to intermediate, eventually from intermediate to ground state. Hence, we have a two photon emission uh, from this three level atom. Uh, and one of them is called the idler and the other one is called the signal photons. And the life, actually the lifetime of intermediate state up are um, quite short and uncertain. And by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle between uh, energy and time, idler and signal photons um, energy or frequency are also uncertain. So that's the energy time entanglement. But uh, the sum of the frequency of idler and signal should be um, pump frequency due to the conserv energy conservation. So we can model the quantum state of this uh, energy time entangled photon with this uh, non-separable probability amplitude with the twice action operation operator. So this is this um, kind of um, illustrate the probability amplitude uh, with respect to the idler and signal photon frequency. There's some always the pump frequency and it shows the uh, strong um, correlations with uh, these the measurement time at the photo detector one and two. So this is the um, energy time entanglement. And then to offer the non-local dispersion cancellation, uh, again, the two dispersive media should have equal, um, the, the dispersive media should be properly designed. And uh, the principle is that make uh, the second order dispersion having um, equal magnitude, but uh, with opposite sign. For example, if you look at this figure, omega versus second order dispersion um, at these frequencies, they have the same magnitude, but with different signs. Then um, we've got the result. Um, so this, if you look at this figure, just the coincident pick, um, time difference versus coincident for uh, four cases. I mean, let's look at this figure. So this is energy time entangled photon case. So this dashed line is the coincident peak of the free space propagation and the red circle and um, blue X curves are um, the result of one-sided dispersive media so that the, the width of coincident peak uh, gets wider than the free space propagation. But if we introduce um, the both sided dispersive media, we have uh, less dispersive um, coincident peak so that we can um, confirm the effect of this non-local dispersion cancellation. Whereas if you look at the case with the non-entangled photon pair, uh, both sided dispers dispersive media case has um, wider um, coincident peak compared with this uh, one-sided case. So then let me uh, summarize my talk. So we have seen the, um, how to quantize the multi-mode uh, EM field with occupation number representation. 
we're able to model the quantum state of uh, various non classical light and photo detections and coincidence. And also, we um, we went through the procedure of quantization uh, with numerical mode decomposition for dispersive and inhomogeneous media. And we've seen the numerical simulation result of home on all Mandela effect and non local dispersion cancellation. And our uh, future work actually is to is to extend our current model to the absorbing media. That's going to be more challenging. That's because the the principle of quantization is hermicity, uh, the lossless. Uh, but then uh, we're currently trying to come up with the model for um, this quantum loss. Actually, useful to um, the describe the current quantum technologies. And also, we are going to explore use of uh, various EM methods, uh, particularly in time domain or method moment, to study the QEM phenomenon. So this is all. Thank you, for, thank you very much for your um, attention. And um, um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Okay, and now for the audience, if you have any question, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. You can either unmute yourself and speak, or you can type in the chat. Are there any questions? Hey, Dr. Rana, I, I'm not in this field actually, but, but just uh, out of uh, curiosity, can you please, please uh, further explain a little bit about the microscopic quantum uh, like, like detection uh, you, you, in one of your early slides? Oh, yeah. So maybe. Uh, okay, macroscopic quantum electron. Yeah. Okay. So, what was your question again? About okay. Uh, this is a macroscopic phenomenon. Uh, for the detection, in uh, maybe next slide, you you have uh, this application for. Okay. Okay. Can you... Mm -hmm. uh, quantum imaging. Uh, if this image are like a ghost, uh, a kind of like a ghost imaging or ghost radar. Yes, actually, this particular scheme um, describes the quantum ghost imaging, meaning that, um, for example, unlike, I mean, in classical imaging, in order to image the system or object to be imaged, we send the light and we should receive the scatter field from um, the object. But in this ghost imaging system, we have a kind of two uh, detectors. Uh, one is called the bucket detector and the other one is called the um, multi, I mean, uh, Is it a pixel detector? Yeah, yeah, pixel detection. Sorry about that. Anyhow, the thing is that the uh, we first send the photon, pair of photon, and there gets entangled here, and then one of entangled photon hit the object, and we um, we measure the scatter field object. But in the other path, we just uh, um, detect the photon, one of the entangled photon, and then eventually we. Uh, can restore the uh, coins pick. Then from the coins, then we can um, uh, rest restruct the image of this object. This is the imaging system. Okay, thank you.
Don't worry, you, you can announce a break. Yeah, <laughs> the, the length depends on yourself. <laughs> you can decide. Yeah, then uh, we may have uh, maybe seven minutes. We're, we're rather ahead of schedule, so uh, maybe we get, come back at 30. 30, okay. Yeah, uh, Shudong, how much is supposed to be the short cost for each person? Because we thought oh. one hour per person, then... Uh, in total, um, it is uh, three hour and uh, 40 minutes because it starts at uh, 8.20 and at 12. So okay. you have plenty of time. Or okay. maybe, uh, okay. at the, maybe at the end of the three talks, maybe at the last, uh, after listening to three talks, maybe some audience have some general questions. Okay, so <laughs> why don't we take a 10 minutes break then or come yeah. back at uh, 9.30? Yeah, yeah, come back at okay. 30. I, everybody's in different time zones, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just call it 30. <laughs> yeah, come 30 back minutes. at 30, not a 30 minute break. <laughs> okay. Okay, we come back later then. See you later. Yeah, I'll See try later, yeah. screen share real quick. Is my screen showing? Yeah, I see something, yeah. Okay, good, good.
So I think we're just about here at the end of the break that we were taking. So hopefully everyone's back at their computer. I will go ahead and get us started here for the third part of our short course today. And so what we talked about, you know, again, is just kind of a quick overview of everything. So Wang uh, walked us through kind of the fundamentals of quantum Maxwell equations and quantum electromagnetics and introduced us to a lot of interesting quantum concepts that uh, you might have you know, varying levels of familiarity with depending on your background. And then following that, Dong Yap uh, talked us through uh, some very interesting recent work that he's been doing on modeling uh, quantum electromagnetic systems numerically. And so there he was, you know, looking at a system in completely a quantum electromagnetic way. So it's only electromagnetics that's going on. We're just looking at photons traveling through or interacting with different types of matter, but in a very kind of general sense so that it's still, you know, that macroscopic framework where it's like a dielectric media, for instance. What we're gonna talk about now in this kind of last part of the course, is something that's very central to quantum computing, quantum communication, any type of quantum information processing, and that's the coupling of electromagnetic systems to quantum bits or qubits. So how do we you know, control these you know, little pieces of quantum information, essentially? So part of the motivation for why we want to look at qubits in the first place uh, comes from you know, the fact that I just alluded to a little bit is that uh, the main ways that we typically control qubits these days are through electromagnetic means. And so the electromagnetic systems that we build around these different types of qubits 
uh, have a lot of similarity to classical electromagnetic hardware that's very near and dear to our hearts and the AP community. And so on this slide, I just have some motivating examples from a special type of superconducting circuit qubits that we'll be talking about quite a bit today, uh, known as the trans one qubit, where we can see all of this lovely microwave circuitry uh, that's built around these different qubits. So for instance, in, in this device on the top right hand corner, we have a you know, small qubit here. And these are just simple coplanar waveguide transmission lines. We have a resonator out of that, a transmission line resonator formed in between a uh, capacitor that you can see here. This is a little interdigital capacitor. There's another one on this other side. It's too small to see from this kind of zoomed out view. And then we have some additional kind of band stop filters and things like that. But again, you know, from a kind of classical EM engineering perspective, lots of this looks you know, very familiar uh, to us. Uh, we can get fancier with our designs. So for instance, in the bottom right here, uh, we have a kind of metamaterial waveguide where if you zoom in really closely on some of these, you know, blocks uh, on this transmission line, you can see all these lovely spirals and meandering lines to give you different kind of inductances and capacitances in the system uh, before it eventually couples to our qubit. And then on the kind of bottom left, again, we have these, you know, transmon qubits with all sorts of microwave circuitry around it to be able to control the qubit. And so that's what we wanna start understanding or gaining an appreciation of what types of you know, circuitry we need around these systems to control them at a basic level and how those interactions look. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today and this last part of the course. Now, in order to be able to build up that understanding, we're gonna to have to start by just getting a better uh, knowledge base on what a qubit is in the first place, kind of how we discuss them, how we think about them, represent their states, uh, all those good things. So that's what we'll talk about first. And then we're going to do a little bit more of a, a, a deep dive on the transmon qubit in particular. Now the transmon qubit is again of interest to the AP community because it, it operates at microwave frequencies. So it's, you know, again, very familiar ground for us. And then it's also a very popular qubit. Uh, so if you're you know, aware of like Google's quantum computer, some of the computers that IBM have done or uh, the quantum computer that uses superconducting circuits out of uh, Janway Pan's group in China, for instance, all these different systems that uh, people are claiming for the first time, you know, really being able to reach quantum advantage with a computing system. So it's better than any classical system could ever be those are all being built using these transmon qubits. Uh, so it's a very um, important topic in the area of kind of quantum engineering these days. So after we have a better appreciation for how the transmon qubit works, then we can start looking at how electromagnetic fields couple to qubits so we can understand all these different pieces uh, that go into the system uh, to be able to operate these types of devices. And then we'll, we'll end just with a brief kind of outlook on the field and some perspectives on where the AP community can potentially have an impact on, on this emerging area. Okay, so, you know, we need to really start from the ground up here. And so the first question we have to ask is what even is a qubit or, you know, that's again, a, you know, smashing together of quantum bit. And so just like a bit is our kind of basic unit of digital information on a computer, a qubit plays that same kind of role for us, but in the quantum world. So it's that basic unit of quantum information. And so the key thing about that, if we remember back to uh, Wang's talk or Dongyup's talk, for instance, is that this qubit is no longer going to just be in a zero state or a one state, it's going to be able to exist in a superposition of those two states at any given time. So again, our classical bit is always either zero or one, the quantum bit can be some interesting superposition of those states simultaneously. And this is what allows you to start having a really different paradigm for looking at information and how we can process it in different ways. So that's a very abstract kind of perspective on what a qubit is. Uh, 
more practically, a qubit is built out of what we would call a two-state quantum system. Again, we need to be able to represent it, that zero state and the one state. Now, the key thing about this being a two-state system is that there aren't additional states that can potentially you know, mess with our system. We don't want our you know, qubit to accidentally go up to some you know, random other state that we aren't aware of or weren't intending to use. So we need two states that are somewhat isolated from any other state that might exist in the system so we can kind of selectively work with them. Now, why, you know, we tend to think about qubits in a very you know, abstract sense is partially because uh, at a physical level, the way that they're implemented, there's still many, many different types of strategies that are being explored uh, to actually build your qubit. So uh, what a lot of people like to say in this kind of field is that we haven't necessarily found our transistor yet in the sense that there's still a lot of different qubits that are being explored and all of them have different shortcomings, all of them have different advantages. We aren't really sure which one is going to uh, necessarily be the right way to go with in the long term. And more than likely, what it looks like now is that we're going to have to use some kind of combination of them. So I have on the bottom here part of the slide and you know, a couple examples of different types of uh, physical systems that can act as qubits for us. So this first one on the left here would be uh, just regular atoms. These are in some sense excellent types of quantum bits. You can think of the atom, it has you know some kind of uh, electron structure, you know, the shells that you learned about in like chemistry or physics courses, where electrons can go from some, you know, ground state uh, and then be excited up into a higher energy state. Now, to be able to control these atoms and interact them with each other, one of the, you know, popular strategies is to capture them in an optical trap. Uh, so we have essentially this lattice here shown is just a you know, graphic depiction of what, you know, so some counter propagating laser beams could potentially produce a type of potential distribution due to uh, the interfering uh, electric fields, for instance. And those are able to hold these uh, atoms in the lattice and then you can play with the laser beams to allow them to interact with each other. A very similar kind of system, for instance, would be uh, known as trapped ions or sometimes cold ion quantum computers. And here we have you know, a similar strategy where we're using some kind of electromagnetic system to trap the ions. In this case, it's a DC as well as an RF potential distribution. And a, you know, very similar strategy where these ions are being interacted with, with laser beams to be able to you know, change states or drive certain interactions. And you can play with the potentials to do other types of you know, interactions between systems. Uh, but these systems, one of the challenges with them is obviously you know, operating with single atoms and ions is rather tricky from a kind of control perspective. You have lots of different laser beams is also kind of bulky. So uh, the scalability of some of these uh, systems is rather challenging. And so this is where solid state systems become uh, of significant interest. And so one of the, again, most popular types of solid state systems that's being explored today are these superconducting systems where we can uh, take a very special type of superconductor that we'll learn about quite a bit more on the later slides, so I won't go into detail here. Uh, but essentially, if we take this special type of superconductor and embed it into some other microwave circuitry, we can kind of design our own atom uh, as opposed to relying on, you know, what physics gives us and just kind of natural atoms. And this gives us a lot of flexibility and control. And it gives us also, you know, some useful aspects of it. Just it's, you know, there in our solid state system, it's fixed in position. It's not moving around. We can't lose it like you could potentially lose an atom, for instance. And so you're able to, um, you know, have a much more kind of predictable or controllable system. So those are the superconducting systems. Uh, another very popular type of solid state system that people work with would be spins in, in different types of solid state systems. So we have two examples here, one being a, a what's called a nitrogen vacancy center. So this is a uh, type of color center defect in like a diamond lattice, for instance, it's optically active. Uh, so it's able to be controlled both with optical fields as well as microwave fields, depending on how you're using them. And then a uh, somewhat you know, related system would be, you know, using different types of spins that are trapped in type of uh, quantum dots, for instance. So again, the, the main takeaway here is just that the 
kind of the variety of systems that exist to be, you know, a possible candidate for a qubit is still very large. And the way that we go about implementing different, you know, control strategies or measurement strategies has to be completely rethought depending on the physical platform that we're working with. So at a high abstract level, you can do a lot of beautiful kind of mathematical theory at just a kind of physics or quantum information science level. But whenever you get down into the engineering or the kind of nitty gritty implementation of the physical systems, it becomes very important to have a very kind of fundamental understanding of the systems that you're working with so that you can see how to translate some of these abstract operations into actual physical things that you can do. Okay, so you know, back to kind of the abstract level, we need a generic way to kind of represent the qubit where we don't want to worry about the physical implementation details of it necessarily. And so this is that zero and one states typically. Now, one of the things that uh, Wang talked about and Dong Yap talked about as well is that we have this type of probabilistic interpretation of the, any type of quantum state that we're working with. And so it needs to be normalizable. So it needs to have a unit length. And so when we do that for this kind of qubit where it can only exist in say the zero state or the one state, one of the very popular parameterization of this state is using two angular variables, this theta and phi. So theta here is essentially you know, setting the magnitude of how much is in zero versus one, and then phi is setting a relative phase between these two states. And so we can take this kind of arbitrary generic representation and we can map it onto what's known as the block sphere to give us a little bit more of a geometrical representation of the state. So the block sphere is over here on the right of the slide. So what we have is the zero state is mapped to the north pole of the sphere. And then the orthogonal state or the other state in our kind of computational basis that we're using, the one state is on the opposite side of the sphere. So it's the south pole. Now, you don't have to only work with zero or one. You could actually work with any superposition of the states. And again, because they have unit length, all the states are going to be describable uh, as the, you know, any point on the surface of the sphere would be a valid quantum state to work with. So again, you know, we don't have to just use zero or one. Other very popular approaches are to uh, use states along the x-axis of the sphere. So that would be this plus state. It's not shown uh, back here, but the minus state would be the, the opposite pole of the sphere along the x-axis. And so this is an equal superposition of uh, either you know plus or minus between these two uh, zero and one states, but we're in still that kind of equator plane. Now the other, uh, again, you know, the next setup is along the y-axis, for instance. And so this gives us the plus i state and the minus i state, where it's very similar to the plus and minus states, but we just have this additional complex phase involved in the setup. So again, these are very common things that you'll see in kind of quantum computing where we want to work with one of these types of basis sets for any kind of computation. Now, again, as far as terminology goes, uh, every once in a while or fairly commonly, you'll hear physicists or people talking in papers about wanting to like rotate the state of the qubit. Uh, and what they're referring to again is implicitly this kind of block sphere representation where they're thinking about say, rotating the state psi here uh, around the X axis, for instance, or around the Z axis or the Y axis. And so the important thing is that different operators that we'll look at later in our system or in these slides, allow us to selectively drive you know, transitions or changes to the state of the qubit by rotating it around these different uh, control axes. Okay, so that's kind of our, our general representation of, of a qubit. So what we want to look at now is you know, kind of at a high level, what properties do we need uh, from a qubit for it to be you know, quote unquote good? And so typically the agreed upon conditions are known as DiVincenzo's criteria. So this is something that a physicist proposed as kind of the necessary things that we need to be able to do to do both quantum computing and quantum communication. 
So he gave us seven different kind of criteria. And this is a kind of typical test that people will have for any type of physical system that we want to use as a qubit. Uh, you'll have you know, kind of early physics papers talking about being able to demonstrate the DiVincenzo's criteria with that particular physical system. So we're going to walk through each of these different ones a little bit on this slide, and then we will uh, consider, you know, in a little bit more detail what some of these properties mean later in the slides with our particular emphasis on the superconducting circuit implementations that we're interested in. So the first criteria of interest for quantum computing is that we need to have a scalable physical system with a well-characterized qubit. So well-characterized qubit in this instance means that we need to have a good physical model for the system. So we need to understand it very well. We need to know what states it can exist in, how it can transition between different types of states, and how it interacts with different you know, physical systems. If we don't have that kind of you know, solid understanding of the system that we're working with, it's you know, more or less hopeless to be able to successfully use it as a qubit because we just don't know what we're doing. Now, scalable physical system here uh, has really two meanings. So whenever an engineer tends to think about scalable, uh, we would think about that you know, in terms of, you know, can I make tons of these and, you know, a, an array kind of layout and control them well? And is that going to be practical? Is it going to be cost effective? Uh, is that, you know, feasible? And so that is a very important kind of consideration whenever it comes to these types of, you know, qubits and wanting to use them for quantum computers. Uh, for instance, you know, quantum computers to really hit the kind of ground running with solving you know very practical applications that people are interested in you need thousands to millions of qubits for instance so you know we need to be able to have quite a few of them and so those kind of engineering scalability constraints are very important but from d vincenzo's criteria really what the scalability here means is that we need to make sure that the physics of the system doesn't change in kind of a deleterious way as we add more qubits into the system so as particular examples, there were earlier approaches where I think, you know, using some types of spins and like a nuclear magnetic resonance kind of setup was looked at as, you know, you could potentially do a lot of uh, the other types of criteria that we'll talk about later here. Uh, but the main, the kind of key drawback of the system was it, it didn't end up being scalable because as you added more qubits into the system, your sensitivity to measurement kept lowering. And it reached kind of this point where it was never going to be able to work from just a physics perspective as a quantum computer, because by the time you scaled it up to a uh, usable size, it would be impossible to measure any aspect of it. So that's more of the kind of scalability that they're talking about is the physics of the system, you know, changing substantially due to the number of, you know, physical systems that we have in the system. Okay, so that's the first criteria. The second criteria is uh, we need to be able to initialize the state of the qubits to some known state kind of going in. So, you know, typically this is going to be like the ground state of a system. So, you know, the reason, you know, this is, you know, typically a fairly easy uh, you know, setup to have um, if we're using like the ground state of a system because, you know, as long as the states are isolated enough and we don't have, you know, a very uncontrolled environment, uh, any, you know, state out of its equilibrium position is eventually going to say like spontaneously emit its, you know, radiation, for instance, and drop back down into its ground state. So as long as you wait long enough, everything should be able to coalesce back down to its ground state. And you can use that as kind of your initial state to have like a predictable starting point for any, you know, run on quantum algorithm that you're doing. Okay. So the next criteria is that we need to have long relevant decoherence times. So what this means is uh, decoherence in this sense essentially means that every single quantum state that we have is you know, some kind of coherent superposition of states, zero and one, for instance. Now there's all sorts of different types of noise that exists in a quantum system that's going to keep kind of poking that state and causing it to change itself a bit. Again, if we think about that block sphere representation, it's constantly getting poked around so that it's never you know, quite deterministically known where it is exactly. And eventually you can have things happen like spontaneous emission, for instance, where the state will just spontaneously fall apart. 
And so what we mean here is that the you know, chance of that happening, that decoherence time needs to be long enough compared to how quickly we can drive certain gate operations uh, to be able to successfully run like a quantum algorithm, for instance. And this is where uh, a lot of current systems sit is we really need to push uh, that decoherence time to be better. Uh, we need longer uh, times for the system to decohere so that we can get more operations in. The fourth criteria is we need to have a universal set of quantum gates. So this is very similar to like classical computing where you need to have, uh, for instance, you can synthesize any type of logic operation using only NAND gates. And so in that sense, a NAND gate is a universal set. The same kind of concept can be extended to the quantum area where it's no longer going to be a NAND gate, for instance, but the types of gates that we can do with uh, qubits, for instance, you can find you know, a couple uh, a combination of a couple different gates will allow you to be able to emulate any different gate. And that gives you that universal set. So depending on your physical system, you might use you know, one universal set for a trans one qubit, a different uni universal set for trapped ions, for instance, just because of you know, what the systems are naturally good at doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure you have that universal set if you wanna be able to do kind of arbitrary general purpose quantum computing. And then the final criteria for quantum computing is we need to have a qubit specific measurement capability. So all this means is that at the end of the algorithm, at a minimum at the end of the algorithm, we need to be able to very clearly know what you know, final state the system was in. So we need to be able to measure uh, whether the qubit's in the zero or one state whenever we measure it. Okay, now that's all we need technically for quantum computing. But if we want to also be able to do quantum communication, we typically need to have all of those properties. And we also need to have additional two. So the first one is we need to be able to change a stationary qubit into a flying qubit, something that can move around. And this is really just a kind of a tacit assumption that the types of qubits that we're going to use for kind of local computing, for instance, and processing tend to not work very well to be able to uh, you know, transmit information for a very long distance. Again, you know, you can't just take an atom and, you know, throw it halfway around the world very well. Uh, you can't take a superconductor and, and do that. Uh, so flying qubits are typically photons, which are very good, obviously, at transmitting over long distances. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also need to be able to faithfully transmit these qubits between, you know, specified locations. So two locations that we want to actually work with. So this is, you know, at a high level, you know, the criteria that we want to judge qubits by. And being able to do these different kind of judgments uh, becomes very kind of detailed process for the different physical systems of interest. Okay, so what we want to talk about now are uh, some of the types of decoherence that can exist for, for different systems. So Quantum decoherence and quantum noise is a very, very complicated subject, but in you know, many cases we can get by with sort of simpler assumptions for, for many different types of systems. And so for the so when these assumptions work out, uh, which is typically if we think of the noise as being kind of predominantly like a white noise or very short correlation time, uh, we end up with uh, decoherence that just gives kind of exponential decay functions, just like you would have, say, a, you know, RC time constant or, you know, things like that in a circuit, you can have that same type of exponential decay for quantum states. Now, the ways that the quantum states can decay are you know, a couple different predominant ways. And so we're gonna look at the terminology here. So the first one we're gonna talk about is longitudinal relaxation. And so this is called longitudinal because it occurs along the axis of the qubit. And what's happening is we're looking at noise causing the system to go from say the excited state spontaneously down to the ground state or in principle, it can go vice versa, where it goes from the ground state and it spontaneously absorbs enough energy to get excited up into its excited state. Now, that spontaneous excitation tends to be, you know, not as much of a significant deal in like quantum computing, just because it tends to need to be a lot of energy to be able to do that. 
Uh, and so just getting that from like random environmental fluctuations uh, tends to be harder to do, but spontaneously emitting your energy. So from going from one to the zero state is something that definitely happens and has to be worried about. Now, because these states can be viewed, this kind of transition from the one state to the zero state can be viewed as a rotation around either the X or the Y axes, on the, the uh, block sphere, we tend to think of these as being transverse noise sources that drive this type of interaction. So again, it couples to operators that can drive rotations around the X or Y axes, and that's what allows us to spontaneously decay, for instance. So that's longitudinal relaxation. And uh, again, kind of standard notation that you'll typically hear is that rate is called like gamma one and the inverse of it would be the t1 time so that's the amount of time that it takes for that decay to you know kind of happen like a one over e type decay now uh, additional types of noise uh, it would be you know pure dephasing so in this case we're having longitudinal noise so the noise is coupling to the Z axis along the direction of the qubit. And what this essentially does is it changes the operating frequency of the qubit so that we don't know, uh, you know, again, it, it drives rotations around that Z axis. So if we thought we were, you know, polarized along the X axis of the block sphere, in reality, this purity phasing is going to smear that state out so that it covers some kind of arc here where it becomes uncertain. Now, in reality, uh, the purity phasing alone isn't exactly easy to ascertain in kind of a, uh, you know, a time like a T1 time. What actually happens is transverse relaxation, where we have a kind of phase destroying process happening for uh, in multiple ways, where we can have noise coming along all the different qubit axes. So the Z axis gives us that purity phasing but then the X and Y axes still allow us to do that kind of spontaneous decay. So again, this gamma two time is really looking at if we have some equal superposition state, for instance, some like zero plus one state, how long does it take for that, you know, superposition to basically completely fall apart? And that's this gamma two time. And so that is related to this you know, inverse of this T2 time, what we see is it has both the component due to purity phasing, but then also a component due to that just kind of spontaneous decay that can happen to that first excited state, the, the one part of the qubit. And so again, controlling both of these different types of relaxation rates is a very important process in quantum computing and making qubits better, essentially. Okay, so that's, you know, our basic kind of thought process on, you know, how we think about qubits for the most part. Now we're going to start talking about more specifics on the transmon qubit in particular. And it's going to take us a little while to get there because they involve these very special types of uh, superconductors uh, known as Josephson junctions. And so we really have to understand, you know, a lot of things on the way to, you know, being able to have a good understanding for the transmon. Okay, so you know, why are we interested in superconducting hardware platforms in the first place? Well, they have many kind of very appealing properties for quantum information processing. Uh, essentially, the kind of special physics of superconductors allows what would be you know, very kind of incoherent collections of electrons in a system when they get cooled down into this superconducting condensate. Uh, it becomes uh, possible to interact with these quantum systems on a macroscopic scale. So on the size of regular you know, circuit components, for instance, we can interact with a very quantum property. So that's you know, completely different from, you know, for instance, interacting with like an atom, which is you know, incredibly tiny. And what that allows us to do is a couple different things. One, because the size is bigger, we're able to interact with it and manufacture and fabricate things in a much easier way, which is very appealing. Uh, we're also able to design the systems in that sense, because we're not using just a single atom, we're you know, using an artificial atom, something that we have design control over. And then finally, the strength of the interactions that we can get are also much, much higher with these superconducting systems because we're not just interacting with like a single electron and a single atom. We're interacting with a collection, a coherent collection of many, many, many different electrons. And that allows us to have a much stronger interaction where we can have you know, a lot more interesting physics going on. Now, 
all of these uh, you know, properties, again, come down to, we have a very flexible plat platform to work with. And because of that, there's three kind of primary classes of qubits that have been used in these superconducting systems. And a quick note on terminology before I forget, um, these superconducting circuit systems are typically referred to as circuit quantum electrodynamics or circuit QED devices or qubits. So within the circuit QED architecture, we have three kind of primary classes of qubits that were the kind of original ones that were built. And then there's many more that have been designed uh, since then, but they can typically be related back to, you know, what one are they most similar to from these three. So the three, again, are charge qubits, flux qubits, and phase qubits. We're only going to talk about charge qubits because the transmon qubit turns out to be a kind of optimized form of charge qubit. Now, one of the things that we'll note from these different circuit diagrams is they all have this kind of goofy X symbol in them. And in kind of regular electrical engineering world, we're not very familiar with this. This is the circuit symbol for a Josephson junction, uh, which is a very special kind of nonlinear component uh, that we have in superconducting systems. And so again, to be able to understand these qubits, we need to first understand how Josephson junctions work. So at a high level, uh, you can make Josephson junctions in many, many, many different ways. But whenever we're talking about kind of quantum computing applications or quantum information processing, for the most part, uh, the types of Josephson junctions that have been used to date are these superconductor insulator superconductor sandwiches. So essentially, we have a very large superconductor on one side, another one on the other side. And we have a very thin insulating gap in between them. It's about a nanometer thick. Now, what this ends up allowing to happen is just like you can get tunneling through a type of potential barrier and like a diode or transistor, for instance, when you have this very thin insulator, you're able to get tunneling of the quantum states in this superconductor over into superconductor two and vice versa. So we characterize these systems in terms of the difference in the, the number of Cooper pairs in the two systems. And just again, terminology wise, Cooper pairs are the charge carriers and superconductors. It's just a bound, you know, a collection of, you know, two electrons pair up essentially in a superconductor and they behave very differently uh, from, you know, just regular electrons do. That's what gives these superconductors their kind of interesting physical properties. But for our purposes, we don't need to know anything about that beyond the fact that uh, they're called Cooper pairs instead of electrons, but they're charge carriers. So again, we're going to characterize the dynamics of this junction in terms of the difference in the charge, number of charge between the two, and then also the phase of the quantum function or the quantum state function between the two superconductors. So those are a little bit unintuitive. We can get a bit of a circuit analogy going if we uh, take this system, uh, Josephson, who you know, these are named after, derived the two Josephson relations. And so what we have is that the current that's flowing through this junction is equal to the sign of the phase difference between the two. So this is the tunneling current at zero voltage. And then we also have a relationship between the time derivative of that phase and the voltage over the junction. So we can just do some simple calculus with this and take the time derivative of the current and get this result from you know, plugging in from these Josephson relations. And what we see is we can rearrange this and we have the IV relationship of an inductor, essentially due to this tunneling physics that exists. And the important thing is that this inductance is nonlinear. It's very nonlinear. And uh, it's nonlinear based off of, you know, again, that, that phase variable, which is like uh, the voltage, the time derivative of the voltage. Now, the Josephson junction is predominantly a nonlinear inductor, but it's not just a nonlinear inductor. It's also in parallel with a weak capacitance. The reason for that is just we have two superconductors that are near to each other. So that just behaves, you get, you know, geometric capacitance just like you would get between any two conductors. And so that goes in parallel with that nonlinear inductance. So that is still a little bit non-intuitive. We don't tend to learn about how to work with nonlinear inductances in our kind of beginning circuits classes, for instance. And so what makes uh, being able to understand these Joseph's injunctions a little bit easier is by coming up with a mechanical equivalent for the system. 
And it turns out that the mechanical equivalent, we actually have an exact mechanical equivalent, is a rigid rotor with a mass on the end of it. And what we can do is a mapping between the charge difference for the Josephson junction and the angular momentum of this rotor, and then this phase difference and the position of the mass of the rotor. And so if we write out the Hamiltonians for these systems, it's a little bit easier to do for uh, the mechanical equivalent. But again, we have something that looks very similar to what we had earlier in today's short course. We have the momentum squared and then an additional you know, term due to the potential energy. And we see this looks more or less like the Hamiltonian for the uh, Josephson junction. This is from the nonlinear inductance. This is from that weak capacitance. So EC here is the capacitive energy. So we can you know, go through some of those processes that Wang talked about earlier using Hamilton's equations and derive the equations of motion for the system, consolidate them, and we get a you know, simple differential equation for the phase of this Josephson junction. And we see that it lines up very well with the uh, differential equation for the position of this mass. And again, we can see EJ here is playing the role of G more or less, and EC is proportional to the inverse of the capacitance. So we see the capacitance of the junction is like the radius or the length of this rotor. Now, the important thing about these qubits uh, using Josephson junctions is the fact that this kind of characteristic ratio of EJ over EC can range over huge, very uh, orders of magnitude and give us very different dynamics. So again, you can think of, you know, from the pendulum case, you know, for instance, if you have a very, very short uh, radius, the inertia is very low, for instance. And you can think of, you know, a little bit of jump in the momentum, for instance, being able to potentially change the position of that uh, rotor very quickly, very rapidly, kind of spinning around and around. On the other hand, if you make this radius extremely large, and so then there's a large amount of inertia to it, it take a lot of momentum to potentially perturb uh, the position of the mass. So again, we can, you know, change the dynamics of these systems quite substantially by the control over this ratio of EJ over EC. Okay, so that's the little bit more intuitive picture of the Josephson junction dynamics. Uh, now, just a single Josephson junction by itself is pretty useful, but what's very interesting is that we can actually make them tunable uh, by arranging the two of them in parallel. So, you know, this is of interest because if we can tune the parameters of the, you know, Josephson junction or the effective Josephson junction in situ, uh, it gives us a lot more uh, control mechanisms for the qubits that we might make with these. It also allows us to make up for any kind of manufacturing errors. You know, you know if you can tune the frequency of the qubit, uh, it allows you to, you know, align it with a resonance, for instance, that maybe wouldn't happen if the frequency of the qubit was just purely random based off of manufacturing variation. Now, the particular arrangement that we're looking at here is known as a DC superconducting quantum infer interference device, or SQUID. So this is one of the most popular approaches to be able to tune the effective junction characteristics. So this is what we're looking at here. We have two Josephson junctions in parallel. And we have a small kind of superconducting loop that's formed in between them. We can zoom in, and again, this is that Josephson junction where we have one layer of the junction. It gets oxidized so that there's you know not a direct contact between this other superconductor that's laid on top of it, and you get this very small uh, Josephson junction here. So how does this lead to tunable characteristics? Well, we can look at the Hamiltonians for the system and kind of reason our way there rather quickly. Uh, so if we start uh, by looking at two parallel Josephson junctions, we're going to just look at the inductive energy of this Hamiltonian. And so we just modify what we had before. We just get another junction in here. And we're going to assume that they have the same junction characteristics just for simplicity, but it doesn't change the end result if they're asymmetric. So we have these two different phase variables for the phase difference across the two Josephson junctions. Now, that is you know, fine. The additional constraint that we have, though, is that these phases of the superconductors at any point in the system is a you know, true kind of variable of the system. And so it has to be 
uh, a single valued function it has to be a good well defined single valued number. And what that ends up doing is we get what's known as flux quantization around any superconducting loop essentially the phase difference between these two junctions is going to have to equal some uh, integer multiple of two pi to ensure that if you go to any point uh, as after going around the loop that it's still single valued phase. Now this loop is very similar to like Faraday's effect or like electromotive force, for instance, where if you have a magnetic flux intersecting the loop, it's going to lead to additional current flow that you know can you know support or fight the you know flux that's penetrating through it, and that gets added into this flux quantization effect as well. Or phi here is the uh, um, that magnetic flux intersecting the loop, and phi naught here is just a you know set of constants that normalizes it to the magnetic flux quantum. And my mouse isn't working. Um, okay, there we go. So if we take this uh, flux quantization, the first thing we're going to do is we're we're going to start with this Hamiltonian. We're just going to rewrite it using simple trig rules. So you know write it into this cosine cosine and we have the difference and the addition of those two variables this difference here we can substitute in for the uh, from the flux quantization effect and what we end up having is this end result 2ej cosine of this applied flux and so what we can think of is this entire front part as just being some effective new josephson energy this ej that now depends on that flux that we applied. And that's what makes it tunable. And then this additional cosine factor, we can just redefine this summation of the two phase differences as being some effective new phase variable. So the end effect is that this Hamiltonian looks exactly identical to what we had before. So all the physics of the squid, whenever it's placed into a qubit is going to be the same as just a single Josephson junction. But we have this extra added control mechanism where we can change dynamically uh, the uh, junction characteristic in situ, essentially. So this is a very useful and practical degree of freedom to leverage. <clears throat> okay, so now we can go ahead and start talking about uh, charge qubits. Again, the transmon qubit is going to be an evolution of the charge qubit, so this is a sensible spot to start. Now, uh, terminology-wise, again, charge qubits are also sometimes referred to as Cooper pair boxes. They're the exact same thing. Now, what a charge qubit actually consists of, we have a physical implementation of this over on the right of the slide. So we have what's known as a superconducting island that's not directly connected to any other circuitry in the system. And then that superconducting island is connected through Josephson Junction or two in the case of a squid to a larger bulk superconductor that's sometimes also referred to as a reservoir. Now that reservoir can either be connected to uh, additional circuitry or it could just be you know, floating as well like the island. But the main important point is that because this island is, is very small and isolated from the system, we reach a regime where we become very sensitive to the number of Cooper pairs that have actually tunneled onto the island. And this becomes a very good quantum number that we can actually discriminate down to the single Cooper pair kind of level, how many Cooper pairs have tunneled onto the island uh, with respect to you know, some equilibrium position. <clears throat> so at this point, we need to actually quantize the description of the uh, qubit. You know, again, we're going into the quantum area, so it has to be quantized. And so what ends up happening is these canonical conjugate variables within this Hamiltonian mechanics framework for the qubit, for the Josephson junction, are just that phase difference and this number operator, or this charge kind of operator, and they have this canonical commutation relation. And this allows us to quantize the system. And again, we can start talking about the actual discrete number of Cooper pairs that have tunneled onto this island, which would be eigenstates of this N operator. Now, uh, for just a kind of charge qubit, we also need some additional control mechanisms. So that can happen through a voltage source that's capacitively coupled to the island, for instance. And what we end up doing to keep everything in the same kind of units, we write this voltage source in a little bit of a peculiar way. Uh, in particular, we write it in terms of an effective 
charge number. But the important thing to remember is that this NG here is a classical control mechanism. It's not a quantum operator. It's just a classical variable. And it can take on any continuous value. It's not restricted to only being in you know, integer numbers of Cooper pairs. Because again, the voltage can be any number. We're just normalizing it into this you know, charge unit uh, to write everything kind of nicely in the Hamiltonian. But the effect that it has is essentially an offset to the charge variable. And it you know, again, allows us to operate this system in different ways. You know, we can you know, set up the system to different equilibrium points using the applied voltage source. Now, typically these charge qubits to get this type of behavior, we have them operating at this EJ over EC characteristic ratio, much smaller than one. <clears throat> Okay, so let's take a look at the energy levels of this qubit uh, to, you know, again, if we think about D, D Vincenzo's criteria, the well characterized aspect of the qubit. So how do the energy levels depend on that DC bias voltage that we were applying? So here on the, this figure, we're showing the first three energy levels of the system. And we are looking at that as a function of that applied bias voltage. So the first takeaway is that it varies a lot depending on that bias voltage. So uh, understanding its behavior and where we want to operate becomes a very important thing. Now, uh, one of the things that's been alluded to a little bit earlier in, in kind of various presentations, but we'll talk about just a little bit more explicitly here is that the operating frequency of the qubit is going to be proportional to the energy difference uh, between different levels, uh, adjacent levels of the qubit. So again, we talked about like h bar omega as being the energy of a photon. Well, this qubit can only absorb photons if that h bar omega matches the energy difference of, you know, the two states um, that we're tran driving transitions between. So it, with that kind of context in mind, now we can talk about what is going to constitute a good two-level system within you know, the framework of this energy level diagram. So the first thing that we need is we need to have high anharmonicity. And so what that means is that the energy difference between adjacent levels needs to be different from each other. So a harmonic oscillator has completely, um, the energy spacing between all the different levels is identical. And that doesn't work in terms of giving us a two level system because anything that drives the transition from one level can drive the transition to the next level. And so being able to selectively only drive transitions between two states becomes very hard with a harmonic oscillator, essentially impossible. So we need to be highly anharmonic to do that. And so what we see here, for instance, is that we are highly anharmonic, right? The difference, the energy difference between this, these two states and these two states is incredibly different. But this is not a good two-level system because we also need to have large separation between adjacent energy levels. And so that doesn't happen here. And the reason why we need to have that is because if we, say, drove our system up into this excited state, now because this energy difference is so small, it becomes very easy for our system to kind of spontaneously gather enough energy from the environment through, say, like thermal fluctuations, for instance, to be able to then... Uh, excite itself up into this other state and keep kind of oscillating and flipping back and forth between these states. And that completely ruins our coherence. So we can't use this in this kind of NG equals zero bias voltage as a good qubit. So what we need to have then is we need to move somewhere else where we have anharmonicity and level separation. So we could, for instance, use this spot here at like NG equals one fourth. Now, the reason we don't want to do that is we also want to make sure that our two-level system is, you know, has a reduced sensitivity to noise. So again, if we think of NG as just being like a classical bias voltage, there's going to be noise in that bias voltage, which means that the actual NG that we're applying is always kind of fluctuating along the x-axis. So if we look at these different energy levels, for instance, right here, we can see that fluctuations around the x-axis, because the slope is high, is going to lead to large changes in this energy difference between these two states. And that's going to lead to large changes in the actual operating frequency of the qubit. And that causes all sorts of problems for its coherence. And so instead, what we want to do is operate at what's known as this sweet spot at NG equals one half, where we're at these kind of local minima 
of these curves or maxima. And so the slope here is basically zero. And so we have a much better kind of reduced sensitivity to noise. So operating at these points is what kind of led to some of the first you know, experimental demonstrations of quantum effects with these charged qubits. But the issue is that eventually uh, people kept working with them and they, they found that even operating at this sweet spot that has reduced sensitivity to noise, it was still too sensitive to you know, charge noise, uh, noise in this NG variable, that it was never going to be able to work for kind of you know, a fully scaled up quantum computer. So that's where we need to come up with a new way to engineer the system. So if we revisit our analogy uh, to this kind of rotor system, what people realize or, you know, kind of the, uh, the inspiration for this is that the flux qubits and the phase qubits, those other types of, you know, classes of superconducting qubits that people work with, they have much larger ratios of EJ over EC than the charge qubits have. And as a result, they have essentially no uh, dependence on the uh, charge fluctuation. So again, the way to think about that would be like having the radius of this uh, rotor be extremely large so that there's a lot of inertia. And so if you have fluctuations in the momentum or, you know, again, canonically, that would be mapping to the charge. You have fluctuations in that variable. It leads to very small changes in the position of the, uh, of the rotor because there's just so much inertia stopping that from moving. So how can we go about doing that with our superconducting qubit system? Well, what we can do is we can modify EC. In particular, we can make it much smaller by increasing the capacitance around uh, the Josephson junction. What this does is again, it essentially makes this radius much larger. And you can think of the dynamics as being, you know, kind of forced to stay at small values of phi. So we can think then about, you know, the phi in this case, uh, being small so we can do like a Taylor expansion of this cosine or sine terms and if you go through that math you see that what we end up with is a model of a weakly anharmonic oscillator so it's still a nonlinear system but the nonlinearity has been reduced quite a bit so what does that look like in terms of energy levels and you know the kind of implications of that from a quantum computing perspective well, uh, that's shown over here on the right of the slide. So as we go from this charge qubit regime down and around through to the trans one qubit regime, what we see is that as we increase that capacitance, these energy levels start to flatten out as a function of NG. So they become less and less sensitive to that charge variable, but simultaneously they become more harmonic. So we see here, once we reach this trans one regime, that there's essentially no variation as a function of NG, but the di energy difference between these two states and these two states is almost identical. Now, the important thing though, is that the kind of noise or the sensitivity to NG decays at an exponential rate while the harm, harm, and harmonicity decays at a power law rate. And so we still maintain enough nonlinearity or enough and harmonicity that we can still use it as a qubit However, we do need to pay attention to this second excited state in many of our models to make sure that uh, it's not causing problems with our system. So, you know, again, this is what happens whenever we increase that capacitance. How do we actually do that physically? Well, the first way that that was typically done is here's our squid loop, for instance, and we put this interdigital capacitor around the squid loop, and that gives us that stronger capacitance. A more modern way of doing that is using this kind of plus or X shape. The reason for that is we can design different coupling magnitudes to each of the different arms of the system to drive different types of interactions. Whereas if we use like this kind of system where we just have a single coplanar waveguide coupled to the interdigital capacitor, it's that same kind of coupling constant um, for every single control mechanism. Here we can independently design them. So it has better interconnectivity and better kind of design controllability. Okay. So again, you know, just looking at that from another perspective, if we have a linear LC resonator, it has this quantum harmonic oscillator. The energy levels are perfectly evenly spaced. That's the harmonic oscillator nature. Whenever we have the transmon qubit, for instance, now we have this cosine potential at the low line energy states, for instance, 
the cosine potential is still similar to that x squared potential of the harmonic oscillator. And so because we only reach that cosine perturbation a little bit, you know, we only have a small amount of anharmonicity here. But again, still enough to work with. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and move into the kind of final main part of this section of the course where we start talking about field qubit coupling. So, you know, again, at a you know, high level, a completely isolated qubit can never exist in, in reality. And it's also worthless to us if it could exist because we have to be able to control the qubit to process quantum information with it. Now, the difficulty with this is that qubit states are very, very sensitive uh, to all sorts of different kinds of environmental noise that can perturb them. And so, any time we go to interact with it or wire up, you know, some kind of control circuitry near it, we are providing ourselves with a, a, an additional way to kind of interfere with the state of that qubit. So we need to be able to do this in a very careful manner to make sure that we can, you know, control the qubit state and read out its state um, accurately with high fidelity without opening ourselves to too much decoherence. And again, for kind of most kind of current hardware platforms, the way we're going to do this kind of interaction for control and readout is through electromagnetic means. So what we're going to look at now is again, trying to understand a little bit more of you know, what each of these different pieces uh, mean for the system. So we won't go into detail on the flux bias here, but that is just falling through with, there's a little squid loop here. So we just drive a current into this and we can get a magnetic flux and that'll tune the operating frequency of the trans one, what we want to look at more is this qubit drive and this readout resonator. But we're gonna to have to look at the model a little bit to kind of get there and look at how do we you know, even describe these systems where we have interactions between different kinds of particles. You know, For instance, the particles in the trans one and the particles within the quantum harmonic oscillator of like a resonator, for instance. So if we make it just a simple circuit model of the system, we would have a, you know, again, some resonator modeled as an LC circuit capacitively coupled to the transmon. Here's the resonator, capacitive coupling, transmon. So typically the way that we're going to analyze these systems in a kind of mathematical way is by diagonalizing the systems and looking at them in kind of an occupation number representation. So those Fox states that, you know, Dong Yup and, and Wang talked about earlier. So we can take, for instance, the transmon Hamiltonian, we can diagonalize it on its own in terms of the eigenstates of the system. So we can write this in the form of like a Schrodinger equation and solve the differential equation and get these eigenstates and write the you know, corresponding operator in this kind of way. And then the resonator Hamiltonian, for instance, we just need, you know, again, the total energy in the system. So that's the inductive energy. Here's the capacitive energy. We want to diagonalize it in the same kind of way that Dong Yup was talking about earlier, where again, we can think of now this, uh, the current and the voltage operators as being different kind of quadratures of the system. Uh, if you think of this, you know, A operator, so the annihilation operator and the creation operator, if you take a moment and just think of them as like complex numbers, for instance, we have like complex number plus complex number conjugate. So this would be like the real part of the complex number. And then the current would be like complex number minus conjugate of the complex number times minus i. So this would be like the imaginary part. So again, you'll sometimes hear these as referred to as different quadratures of the system that we're writing in terms of these uh, creation and annihilation or ladder operators. Okay, so that is, you know, again, kind of our starting point. We're going to diagonalize these Hamiltonians. Now, the way that we you know, think about the Hilbert space that these operators uh, exist within is in terms of just a simple tensor product of the individual Hilbert spaces of the two systems. So here, for instance, we have the total Hilbert space is now given as the tensor product between the transmon Hilbert space and the resonator Hilbert space. The operators that we write in these different uh, Hilbert spaces are going to uh, just be expanded again through uh, kind of tensor product. So the in operator in the transmon space, for instance, is going to become in tensor product with the identity operator in the resonator Hilbert space. 
Likewise, for instance, like the annihilation operator, it's going to be the identity operator in the trans one space, tensor product with the um, annihilation operator in the resonator space, and so on and so forth. Now, one important property of these kind of you know, identity operators and how these tensor products work out is that operators from the different Hilbert spaces are going to be able to commute with each other. So it doesn't matter what order we write, you know, these J operators with the, you know, A operators, those are going to commute with each other because they're operating still in different Hilbert spaces. And then we're also going to need to use a little bit more expanded notation for the way we represent our states, where again, there's just all sorts of, you know, different ways that you'd write it. But it's again, basically the same concept. It's just a you know, whatever the J state was, tensor product with the, uh, you know, number, the folk, the Fox state or the number state in, you know, the resonator, for instance. So now what we're going to do is, you know, again, that is the diagonalization of the individual or the free Hamiltonians. Now the total Hamiltonian of the system is still missing uh, the third part, which is the interaction between the two systems. And that's due to this coupling capacitance. Now, for this kind of system of a resonator coupled to a transmon capacitively, that interaction Hamiltonian, the main kind of, you know, quantum part is related to the voltage of the resonator and how that interacts with the charge in the uh, transmon. And then, you know, the rest of this is just, you know, simple kind of modifications. So this is a, just a voltage divider that's making sure that the, you know, correct amount of the voltage is that it's just selecting the correct amount of the voltage that's actually seen by the transmon, for instance. That's what this ratio calculates. And then 2E is just, you know, converting the number operator, which just gives us, you know, integer numbers of Cooper pairs that have tunneled through the Josephson junction. We have to multiply that by two times the, you know, charge of an electron uh, to actually get, you know, this in the correct units for energy. So we can go ahead and write this interaction Hamiltonian in terms of those you know, operators that we diagonalize the Hamiltonian and uh, the free Hamiltonians in terms of. And that is going to look like this kind of mess here. We have this double summation due to the, all the different types of states that uh, we might need to test this operator with to see how the in hat operator uh, couples different states of the transmon. Now, one of the important properties of a transmon is once we're in that transmon regime, this in operator actually only couples nearest neighbor states. So we can go ahead and drop one of these summations and just write this operator in terms of, you know, again, what looks like a, in this case, a lowering operator. So it takes, you know, J plus one state and spits out a J state. So that's one lower state in the transmon and it's kind of corresponding raising operator. And again, that's then coupled with the uh, A plus A dagger from the voltage operator. And again, just to consolidate the notation, what we'll typically do is we'll take all this good stuff, all these normalization terms, and lump them into just a single, uh, single G, J. And that is, again, the coupling strength between the two uh, systems, essentially. So we can go ahead and write our full system Hamiltonian, or sorry, we're gonna focus on the interaction still term a little bit. We wanna simplify this down just a little bit more. So what we're going to do is we're going to expand out uh, this kind of product of all these operators. And then the thing that we're going to look at is we're gonna factor out what I'm calling the typical time dependence of these different operators. And what I mean by typical is how would these operators behave if they weren't interacting with each other? So what we're essentially doing is, you know, Dong Yop showed this that, um, for instance, like A operator behaves as, you know, E to the plus, yeah, E to the plus omega R, for instance, and a dagger, you know, oscillates at like E to the minus omega R, for instance. And uh, likewise for the raising and lowering operators of the transmon, just with the transmon frequency. So again, if we pull that kind of you know, basic oscillations out and just leave kind of envelopes of time dependence and the rest of these operators, we see that for these first two terms, we have essentially the difference of the two frequencies that depend on that. And for these last two terms, we have the summation of those two frequencies. And this has very important consequences because if we're at kind of like a near resonant condition, for instance, where 
the resonator is very similar operating frequency, for instance, to uh, the transmon. These terms that, you know, these exponential terms are basically going to be zero, and these exponential terms are going to be varying incredibly rapidly. And what that ends up meaning is that uh, anything that depends on these sequences of operators is going to approximately average to zero over most observation times due to the very fast oscillations of this kind of main part. So a very common approximation that's made in the literature is to set these terms equal to zero. Uh, this is known as the rotating wave approximation. And when we do that, we get out a very famous model known as the James Cummings model or the James Cummings Hamiltonian. Now, for the transmon case, it's generalized because the transmon just has you know, more levels to it than uh, what you have for the typical James Cummings model. Uh, but if we look at this and unpack the physics just a little bit, we have in this first term the uh, just the free transmon uh, behavior, the free resonator behavior, and then the interactions. And if we unpack these interactions just a little bit, this creates a single photon, and we see that that only happens whenever the state of the transmon goes down by one level. So this is describing an emission process where the transmon emits a photon into the resonator. And then we have the corresponding opposite process of absorption, where we destroy a photon in the resonator, and this raises the transmon state from you know, one level up to the next excited level. And so this is, you know, again, you know, seems kind of a simple model at face value, but there's a lot of physics within it that we can study. So the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, known as vacuum Rabi oscillations. And so we are going to, uh, to, to do this. The easiest way is to start out by finding the eigenstates of the entire James Cummings model within that combined Hilbert space. And these are typically referred to as dressed states, just again, terminology. Now to keep this simple, we're going to do it on resonance where the cavity and the uh, transmon are, have the same operating frequency. What ends up happening is that the degenerate levels between the different, you know, the, all the degenerate levels from the original spectrum from each other get split due to the interaction. So what we mean here is on the left and the right here, we have the energy level kind of diagram for uh, the different types of states that could exist in the system. So on the left here, we assume that the transmon's in the, the ground state, for instance, and then we're counting out the energy that exists in the system for different numbers of photons in the resonator. So one photon, two, pho not pho two photons, and, and so forth. On the right-hand side here, this is now we're assuming that the electron, or sorry, the transmon is in its excited state. And so when we're in the excited state and zero photons in the um, cavity, we have this much energy in the system. One photon in the cavity while the transmon's still in its excited state, we have this many, this much energy. And what we see is we have this perfect uh, degeneracy between all of these states, between the two kind of ladders going up on these two sides. That degeneracy gets split due to the interactions. And what we end up with the actual dress spectrum or the spectrum of the eigenstates for the actual James Cummings model is this middle ladder of operators. And we see that this amount of splitting depends on the number of photons that uh, are, or number of quanta that's interacting in the system. Now, the important point about this is if we start out in what was an eigenstate of the original system with no interactions, for instance, the transmon in its excited state and no photon in the uh, resonator, for instance, this is no longer an eigenstate of the James Cummings model. And what that means is that it has to be described in terms of a superposition of these additional states within the, um, the James Cummings model. And so you're always going to have oscillations between uh, the different states of the original system. Uh, so again, kind of more graphically, if we start with the atom in its excited state, it's going to coherently oscillate between being in the atomic state to being in the cavity, back to the atom, back to the cavity, back to the atom. Now, if we had no other interactions going on, this would stay uh, perfectly at, you know, it's a probability, so it would stay perfectly at one, for instance. In reality, the cavity always it's an imperfect cavity, so it has this kind of exponential decay rate just due to that photon being able to leak out of the system at any time. 
Uh, but again, this type of uh, Rabi oscillation, this vacuum Rabi oscillation is a very important effect that we can leverage to do all sorts of kind of interesting state preparation, quantum gates and, and entangling operations between uh, different states of a quantum system. It's a very kind of practical effect uh, that happens whenever we have a good strong interaction uh, between the uh, transmon, for instance, and the resonator that it's coupled to. So that's vacuum Rabi oscillations. The next type of interaction we're going to look at is just driven Rabi oscillations, or sometimes just referred to as Rabi oscillations. So the main difference that's going to happen here is instead of having uh, a quantized interaction with the transmon, we're going to actually apply a classical EM signal to it instead that's weakly coupled to the qubit. Now, in this case, the interaction Hamiltonian looks more or less the same as what we had before, with the key difference being that this voltage operator is no longer an operator. It's just a classical variable like we're used to in, in kind of electrical engineering. Now, the important thing that ends up happening is that we can use two quadratures of this drive signal and this voltage to control the two quadratures of the qubit. Now, it takes a bit of math to see that, but essentially what ends up happening is if we have, say, you know, this suggestively written Vx being uh, like kind of a baseband or envelope function multiplied by a very high frequency cosine, and we have this Vy being multiplied by this sine of a very high frequency oscillation. Uh, we're able to use these different envelopes to control the qubit in kind of uh, very interesting and selective ways. So if we take this representation and plug it into the interaction Hamiltonian, apply some rotating wave approximations and other kinds of approximations, what we see is, again, this baseband kind of envelope couples purely to one quadrature of the qubit, the kind of raising operator plus the lowering operator. And then the Vy is coupling to this other um, <coughs> quadrature of the qubit, the raising operator minus the lowering operator times I, again, those are different quadratures of the transmon being selectively driven uh, by these different quadratures of the applied microwave pulse. So what this ends up doing is it allows us to use this V sub or this Vx or Vy uh, to rotate the qubit state along the block sphere in different ways. So again, the way that you would do this kind of more physically is you'd have just an IQ mixer where we have like an arbitrary waveform generator being used to make the different kind of baseband envelopes that we want for the I and the Q channels. Mix that with a local oscillator that is resonant with the a qubit, for instance, and we apply that kind of pulse to the qubit. And, you know, we can then just apply different sequences of these Vx's and Vy's to drive in different transitions of this qubit to rotate its state around different axes of the block sphere. And, and again, just kind of terminology wise, you'll sometimes hear these referred to as Rabi pulses. Uh, essentially what matters is the amount of area underneath the pulse gives you different amounts of rotations around these axes. So we have like a pi pulse due to this amount of area. We have a pi over two pulse due to this amount of area. And so this one, for instance, drives us a 90 degree rotation around the X axis. So it takes like the zero state and brings it down to this minus Y axis of the block sphere. So again, this is one of the very fundamental ways that you do you know, more or less any single qubit operation in like a quantum computer, for instance, is by applying these kind of classical microwave drive pulses to rotate the qubit state around uh, the block sphere in different ways. Okay, so the last thing we want to look at here is dispersive readout. So this comes back to, again, the, that DiVincenzo criteria. We need some kind of qubit-specific measurement capability. So this is what's used in, again, the kind of quantum computers that like Google and IBM and, and these other uh, folks are, are making. So the, this type of dispersive readout uh, works out in, you know, the name comes from the fact that it's done in what's called the dispersive regime of circuit QED. Essentially, this regime is very different from where we had vacuum Rabi oscillations. And vacuum Rabi oscillations, we had uh, the transmon frequency and the uh, resonator frequency being basically equal to each other. Here in the dispersive regime, we have the 
them being very different from each other, in particular, much larger than the strength of the coupling that we have between them. So under these kind of circumstances, we can take the James Cummings model and we can do some fancy kind of rewriting of it and approximations. And the main important thing that we get out is uh, this on the kind of left-hand side here. This is that free kind of resonator operator. It's the number operator of the system. And what this effectively looks like is that the resonant frequency of the uh, Kind of LC resonator, or in this case, this transmission line resonator, depends on the state of the transmon. So if the transmon is in its one state, for instance, its first excited state, we're going to have a frequency of omega r minus chi. But if the transmon instead is measured to be in the zero state, the readout resonator is going to have a frequency of omega r plus chi. And so again, what this ends up meaning is that we can probe this resonator with like a microwave pulse, for instance, and measure the transmission or the reflection characteristics. And depending on the state of the transmon, the frequency curve of, the, uh, of this resonator is going to get shifted, you know, minus chi or plus chi. And based off of the measurement that we make, we can infer which way it was shifted and have that uh, you know, knowledge then of the final state of the uh, transmon. Now, one of the important things about this is it's a you know, it's called a non-demolition measurement in the sense that it doesn't destroy the state of the transmon. Whenever we finish the measurement, if the transmon was in its excited state, it's still in its excited state. So we can kind of keep working with it from there once we know its state. And that's very different from kind of more optical type systems where, you know, you just absorb like a photon, for instance, and then that photon is completely destroyed. There's nothing left afterwards that you could kind of keep working with. So again, this is one of the kind of unique uh, characteristics of these superconducting systems that we have access to this kind of uh, non-demolition measurement. So anyway, so that is how uh, state is read out with these kind of transmon systems. As far as the kind of Outlook goes to sort of wrap ourselves up here. Uh, field qubit interactions are, you know, an incredibly fundamental tool in the processing of almost all quantum information processing systems. And that doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. So there seems to be a very good future for being able to use electromagnetic systems to kind of control uh, quantum devices. That doesn't seem like it's going to go away. Uh, as far as where the kind of state of the art is now, it's in this, what's known as this noisy intermediate scale quantum era. Essentially what that means is we have a handful of qubits, not enough to do really interesting things, but enough to at least demonstrate, you know, more powerful types of quantum computation than any classical computer could ever do. Uh, but, you know, again, that's for kind of contrived problems that aren't necessarily of, you know, huge significant practical interest. And as far as how the AP community can help with, you know, reaching these systems, you know, taking these systems and making them reach their full potential, well, it's kind of right in the name of this NISC era. Essentially, intermediate scale, we need to scale up the number of devices in the system substantially. And so what we're looking at here, for instance, is Google's quantum computer. And you, know, you can see just these huge racks of equipment, hundreds and hundreds of cables, it looks like, that are going into this system to be able to control it and operate it successfully. And this system uses about, if I'm remembering correctly, 53 qubits. And we need to scale that up to thousands to millions of qubits. So obviously things are gonna need to change a bit with how these systems are built. And we're going to need much better kind of scalability and integration of, you know, classical peripherals into these systems to make this be, you know, more practical to be able to reach the size of systems that, uh, you know, we need to work with. And this is obviously something that the AP community is really excellent and skilled at, right? We have lots of years of experience with designing very complex kinds of antenna arrays, for instance, uh, like ESA's active electronically scanned arrays that have all sorts of necessary uh, RF and digital and analog control mechanisms that have to be integrated into very tight form factors, 
and in very kind of precise ways to be able to build successful systems. So again, those are kind of engineering capabilities that can be really useful in, in scaling these systems to large number of qubits. Uh, we also need to be able to have better integration and miniaturization of the kind of classical control and readout design. So again, what we talked about earlier, you know, we have you know, a lot of mixing and all of this stuff here is completely classical engineering that's needed to be able to operate and control these qubits. And so instead of doing that with like rack mounted arbitrary waveform generators, you can have a large you know, improvement in performance by integrating that and miniaturizing that into something that can you know, exist closer to the qubits, for instance. Likewise, for the readout electronics, being able to do that in a much more integrated fashion rather than, uh, you know, having like a VNA somewhere is, you know, pretty crucial. You can also help with optimizing these hardware designs. That's something that engineers are obviously really great at, designing better control algorithms to help try and minimize different kind of systematic errors that exist, like different types of crosstalk that exists in these systems. You know, again, this is where, you know, an engineering mindset of really digging into a system and optimizing it can be pretty crucial. And then, you know, another area that's kind of near and dear to the AP community's heart is that right now, numerical modeling of these systems is essentially non-existent. You know, they can use things like HFSS or basic, you know, uh, systems to model, you know, just the, some of the classical pieces, but that is a very kind of you know, piecemeal approach to it. And it doesn't allow you to do a fully kind of integrated, you know, simulation of how these qubits are interacting with the, you know, fields in these systems. So it gives a kind of an incomplete characterization if all you're doing is running like an HFSS simulation. And so this is again, where this is kind of a new realm for computational electromagnetics is being able to model these systems and, you know, building the type of design tools that people are going to need for engineers to really design these systems. You know, right now there's no HFSS or CST that you can just open up and sit down and start designing your quantum computer in. And so that's something that, again, I think the AP community can potentially help with uh, just due to our capabilities in, in that kind of uh, computational EM space. Uh, so that's, that's all I've got um, for this area. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that there might be Let me try and get zoom open i can't tell yeah thank you for an excellent talk are there any questions for thomas roth Uh, I have one question, which might be a little bit out of the scope, but I was just wondering if you could share, uh, if you could just comment. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you talked about the use of numerical methods, computational EM to design the quantum computer. Um, another aspect is the development of computational EM algorithms to run on quantum computers, which is somewhat unrelated, but mm -hmm. is also interesting and, and I think quite unexplored. Could you comment on the challenges, um, or if that even is something that's on the horizon? So I'm, you know, that gets more outside of my expertise. Uh, I know there are a couple groups looking at that and kind of like baby steps of, you know, how could you try and solve like an integral equation on a quantum computer? Um, so I think people are investigating that to try and see if that's an, you know, area. And so, yeah, it's certainly, um, something that people are investigating, it might come to pass. Um, yeah, our focus is more on, you know, hoping to, th that's a little bit of putting the cart before the horse, which is important uh, okay. to make sure that, you know, it helps guide, you know, what the hardware needs to be able to do, to do useful things, for instance. But to some extent, you know, quantum computers don't exist to the point that you could use them to like model an integral equation, for instance. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just not quite there yet. Okay, uh, interesting. Other areas that are really important that people are also looking at is any kind of optimization problem. Uh, typically quantum computers can do a really great job at that. 
And so trying to map certain types of like designing of, you know, meta surfaces and, and things like that, um, those kind of optimization problems onto a quantum computer is also another thing that people are looking at from, you know, how could a quantum computers, you know, help the AP community do things that are traditionally hard. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can make a comment on that. I think Thomas is right. Um, when it comes to solving optimization problem, like a, a traveling salesman's problem or solving the problem of finding the shortest path in the labyrinth or something like that, I think, I think computers, like quantum computers can do a great job. Okay, but they are not programmable like a current digital computer. You cannot write big programs. But I envision that there are certain things that quantum computers can do really well, like um, doing the quantum FFT, for instance, doing the Fourier transform using the quantum processors. That might not be that difficult to program. And they have been talking about doing that for quite a while. Uh, if you can do that, for instance, you can uh, have the Shor algorithm, you can really break codes. I think quantum computers would be useful limited cases uh, where they have a tremendous impact, but they are not general purpose computers. I think they wouldn't be for a long time to, call, to come. Okay, thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we can go ahead and, and wrap up the short course. Um, you know, at least on behalf of myself and, and Dong Yup and Wang, we really appreciate everybody you know, signing up for the course. We hope this was informative for you. I uh, hope you get kind of a perspective on, on this field a bit and, and get interested in, and hopefully more of us will continue looking from the AP community at how we can work in this kind of exciting emerging new field. Um, you know, again, I think Wang mentioned this earlier, but I think we're all you know, very happy to uh, answer questions and things like that. If you know, something comes to you, you know, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll uh, happily get back around to, to answering you. Yeah, feel free to ask us any questions that you have because we are very happy to share this knowledge with you. And again, I'm just a student in this area as well. A lot of things, a lot of these things are very new to me as well. Okay. So shall we let everybody go and yeah, yeah, I think we can uh, close out the, the Zoom room. Okay. Is that correct? Shouldn't can we close out the you. Zoom room? Since no, yeah, the... uh, yeah you, you can announce the end. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to hit end meeting for all. <laughs> okay.